Good deal. Okay, the room is filling up. All right. Cool. Portfolio. Hey, Jason. Would you mind if when I'm talking about the classes, please jump in and fill in about any additional information you want to talk about them? Okay. Um, it will be very short and very brief. So just the things that we went over yesterday. You got it. Got it. Hey, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining today. Uh, really great to have you. We're just going to give it a few seconds just to make sure that everybody gets in the room with no issues and then uh, we'll be uh, starting up the event today. Hey John, uh, I think uh, I think the room is full, uh, so uh, why don't we take it from here? Okay, hey everybody, this is John English. Um, I'm the director of the Visual Arts Passage, along with my partner here, joined with uh, Timmy Trabon. And today our focus is going to be on um, Jason Felix doing um, a presentation about himself, about his work, and um, how he inter interacts with the industry, and then he's going to do a demonstration at the end of, uh, I don't know if he's going to do character or creature, but he's going to do some kind of development in that direction. Um, so, but before he gets started, I want to talk about a couple of things. Number one, you are in a, um, a Zoom room. This is a lecture room, not our real classroom, but it's very, very similar. Um, and in the classroom, major difference is everybody has camera, everybody has microphone. Most of the time people have, are turning their cameras off and on and their microphone, they can, they can speak at any time. And it's a very intimate setting. Everybody kind of feels like they're in the front row. Uh, we had Vipka 9 a couple of weeks ago and that was her experience. She was blown away with the, just at the ability uh, to communicate and how well um, every, you know, her first experience in being in an environment like this and how well, it, how well it worked for her. So um, you have a couple of things that we're gonna to use today. Um, we're, we always like for you to ask questions throughout our presentation. Uh, the first tool uh, that I want you to experience in this classroom is or this lecture room is the chat. Does everybody know, can see their chat in the uh, bottom right hand corner of their menu? And if you can, and please do, because we'd like to you to use it, uh, please type in where you are from. I always, always love to see where people come from. India, Berlin, New Jersey, Oklahoma. A lot of visual arts passage students here today. Yep, that's very cool. Now I'm sure there'll be more coming in. Um, so um, with uh, very typical, uh, typically in a class, the chat is used in, in place of the Q and A, and you'll also see there's a Q and A, and that is where we want to field questions from. Uh, we would like you to ask all your questions, and then I will be asking questions to Jason by what shows up in the Q and A. So, I hope everybody can find the Q and A. 
to me, is there any other technical thing that anybody should know? No, I think uh, I think we're set to go. Just uh, if you do have questions, uh, be sure to type them in through the Q&A. John and I are going to keep an eye on that throughout the, the whole um, event today. And we'll be passing those questions on to Jason. Uh, we usually pass on every question. So uh, don't be timid. Um, really uh, feel free to ask away. Okay, so I'm going to open up the Q&A. And there's no questions in the Q&A right now, which I wouldn't expect there to be. So um, our focus today is going to be on Jason Felix and Jason Felix producing, showing his work and producing an image for you. Um, and that ties in to what we're about to offer. And we have been, I think, delivering a, a, a program on the illustration side that is just phenomenally good. I'm so proud of the students. I'm so proud of the, the education and how it works, the, 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 the way we communicate, the way we keep track of our students and pay attention to our students throughout the week, uh, what their needs are. I think our students would 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 tell you the same. At least I hope they would. Um, we're, about, we're about to uh, embark on rolling out a concept art program, a concept design program or concept art program with the focus on design that is uh, going to parallel the illustration program. Uh, Jason, which I'm proud to say is, is leading the charge and we'll be delivering the first class. There's going to be four classes. It's going to be linear, um, just as it is in the illustration program. And it's, and it's going to kind of mirror, but the needs are going to be different based on the industry. Foundations are fairly similar. Um, the idea of developing the skill set in the first class, in our first class, which is called concept art, uh, excuse me, concept design, and their focus on that is going to be developing a character, a creature, and an environment. And all of the things that Jason can bring into um, showing you the intricacies of doing that. There's a second, uh, a second concept design class, which is called Advanced Concept Design. Um, that class is going to bring all of those things together and where you'll be creating uh, com a complete image in concept, uh, uh, in the concept, advanced concept set design class using what you've ascertained from the first one to develop a new character or creature in an environment. Um, the third class is our world, build our world building class. And Jason, feel free to jump in. Um, you know this information better than I do. Um, but it's going to be developing a specific um, IP or a specific, a specific piece that deals, that deals with developing from um, an art description. And the first part of the, the, the first half of that class, you'll be developing from art description that we give you, um, from that the mentor will give you, meaning Jason. And then the second half of that class will be delivering uh, you developing in the area of the industry that you want to develop, um, uh, develop towards, where you want to aim your, aim your work towards the industry. Jason, am I on track on all this stuff? Can you? <laughs> no, you're saying you're it really spot on, man. It really is. And uh, the only thing I'm jumping and say is that the way this is structured has been my experience uh, working in the industry. So just to share with you, I'm definitely uh, an old watchdog when I say that. I've been working in the industry since 1998. So this is pre-3D. This is all 2D stuff, pixelated, whatnot. And my introduction to working in game development started off essentially doing just brass taxes. I was doing character character design, creature design, but I was also doing 2D, you know, orthographs. So everything was all drafted and drawn. 
And eventually as the industry evolved, so did my skill set, and it went into going from just simply just doing some designs to doing a presentation. They call it key art. Like, what is this world about? Give me one image that sells me what the game is about. And that's where, that's the second tier for advanced concept design, leaning more towards pitching a key art to sell a client on what they want to buy or what they want to pursue. And the last part, world building, once again, that's what I've been hired to do a lot lately, is that um, it goes above and beyond just pr producing artwork. It's actually concretely designing the world, its inhabitants, and also creating key art, but it's establishing an IP. And uh, again, I think that's critical in terms of where I love to be. And I think a lot of people want to be on that same page. They want to bypass being a production artist and be more of a, I'm a guy who's going to, or a girl, a person who's going to supply um, a unique vision um, that can be built into a new IP. A content creator. Yeah. A content creator. There you go. Bingo. Yeah. So, and then our last course is kind of developing yourself for the industry and the things that, that uh, relate to um, the direction that you want to develop in. Um, so you'll be working with Jason to develop polished, finished work. Um, what was the, Jason, you told me the term I should know. Uh, uh, Jason's educated this. Uh, ed educated. <laughs> and, and, and I thought I had a pretty good understanding of it. Um, he's taking it so much deeper and I, I, I feel so comfortable that, that he is the one delivering. Um, that, will, that will be delivering the information and help us outline this information. But yeah, it's, yeah it's, uh, it's really defining exactly what you want to do in the industry. Um, I'll give you a great analogy and example is that if you know exactly what you want to do with the industry, it's going to cut through the chase. It's going to allow you to go specifically to the job that you want. So if you want to be a concept artist, great. If you want to be a production de designer, fantastic. If you want to work in feature animation, feature film, you know, there's all these all these amazing things you can do in entertainment industry, but each one of them has a bit of a different requirement, a different skill sets needed, and a different portfolio that needs to be provided in order to showcase and to land those jobs. And that's what I would really be um, focusing on what your goal is and help you define your portfolio and your direction. And so just, just in general, and it's very nice, thank you for the people that are saying nice things about the class of students that are enrolled in the illustration program right now. Um, the idea is to, is, is to help you organize all of this stuff and to deliver it in a linear fashion that's going to help you to prepare yourself to be industry ready. Um, that's what we're doing on the illustration side, and we are having, and we have had with, uh, with the passage over the last two years and with the Illustration Academy over the last 20 plus years, tremendous success of our students going on and becoming leaders in the industry. And that's, that's what we're interested to do in, in the concept side. If you don't know it or not, which um, we, all of our classes are delivered live, like in a very similar, in a classroom, not a lecture room like so it's much more in intimate. There's a maximum of 12 students in a class. And the classes are delivered live on the weekends in a three-hour three class. And then during the week, we use a product, a Slack product, which is like a linear, old, like an old linear forms-based website um, that you can model for each class. And I'm so impressed and so proud of the community that devices help us develop. Our students communicate with our instructors sometimes daily. Um, our instructors are required to come in and check up on the student work a couple of times a week. And it, it makes the classes so much more beneficial. The, the interaction, especially from the students that start at the beginning and go through the program, these people know each other extremely well, well quickly, but they are, they're on a mission, they're like-minded and they're on a mission to be, of doing the same thing. They learn exponentially through each other. And it makes the Saturday or the Sunday live class so much more beneficial because you know exactly where that student is, you know where you are, 
um, the, 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 the instructor has spoken to you during the week, but you, you, you are learning through the other students. And I'm going to make a, a, this is a very important thing for me because I think generally that students start to recognize things happening in other people's work quicker than they do their own. And it's sometimes people get so close to what they're doing, it's very difficult for them to see simple things in their image. But when they're starting to listen to the critique and see the successes and failures of the other students, they're starting to, and they don't realize it, but they're starting to make opinions on their own with the information we're delivering them. And it helps them. It's just as a, it's just like I learn by teaching all the time. I learn how to react. It helps me in my own artwork. And I think that the, the experience, that, that the relationship of going through the process with a group of people, I think completely enhances the relation, the, 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 the experience. And it helps people learn exponentially. So with all of that said, um, I'm going to say thank you to Jason for very much for helping us articulate this and move forward with us on delivering that first class. And Jason, I would like you to share your screen now. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> of course. All right. So... Uh, and to give just a, just a little bit of that big background, I, I've met Jason, and he's actually taught with me before. I met Jason, uh, I think in 2011 is when I met him. And, he, and I met him because of his industry practice and his successes in the industry. And th I mean, just take a look at this, what this guy's done. Um, and look how cool he looks. Too. <laughs> it's a me. Uh... Yeah. Well, my mark is civilized. So um, the only reason why I'm pointing out my website is just that if you want to go and read a little bit more about um, my upbringing versus what I've done, um, this is pretty concrete. This this is updated up until last year, but this is some of the, uh, the credits and credentials I had over the years. Not only have I worked um, in game development, but also worked in publication as well. Um, so I worked on book covers. I've done um, illustrations for for, for manuals, uh, I've been working with Magic the, the Gathering for a pretty long time now. Um, so, so this is some of the credits that I have. Um, and again, it goes through all these different industries. Um, and what's that, Jason, I'm gonna say one more thing. Yeah. Uh, Jason has developed his personal projects also that relate to really good illustration and really good paint um, and something I am I, I, I'm thoroughly impressed with what a good artist he is. So with that said, this is, this is Jason Felix. So All right. take it over, man. All right, man. So can, they, can everybody see this uh, files that I'm sharing right now? Um, so I was gonna show, show you the best of the best in terms of portfolio and kind of give you like a rundown of, um, once again, where I've been and what I'm currently doing. So. I just want to make sure you guys can see this artwork. I'm trying to load it up. So, um, John, is this is this coming uh, coming up? Oh yeah, I can. Yeah, I can see it in the JPEGs. So I can't see it opened yet. But you cannot. Okay, because it's opened on my screen. So, huh. all right. Uh, Jason, you know what you know what you're doing is you're not uh, you're sharing a just a window on your desktop. So if uh, uh, the way you could share it is by sharing your whole desktop or. Um, hmm. Okay. It's because it's opening it in a different window. That's why yeah. it's not sharing. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Well, let me try doing the whole, uh, let's see here. So let's see here. So, uh, so let's see here. So screen. Yep. And all right. So I'm going to share that. Okay, cool. So let's try that again. Does that pop up? Yeah, yeah. it looks great. Awesome. Cool. Right on. So uh, this piece is actually uh, would be considered key art. So it's selling what the world is, the creatures, inhabitants. Um, essentially, it's a narrative, narrative that's been illustrated. Uh, what a lot of different studios are looking for right now when it comes to pitching a property, whether it be a video game or a film, is that they want one image that shows conflict, that gives an idea of what the character is about, gives an idea of what the world's about, and also exactly what's happening. Um, 
So I, I created this image and this actually led to me working with a sideshow on the Core of the Dead series. So I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with Core of the Dead. If not, you should look it up. It's beautiful. It's original IP that's being created by uh, Tom, Tom Gilliam and um, just some really edgy stuff. So uh, this is also the mirror right now. This image is done for a Magic the Gathering. And um, so if anybody's familiar with Magic, I helped design the creatures called Eldrazi's. And Eldrazi's are pretty much these ethereal sort of alien, quasi beautiful, but deadly creatures. And um, what my process has changed, it went from traditional painting and drawing into embracing digital tools. So as you can see right here on the left, we have the actual final image, but on the far right here, this is the actual model that I built. And I did a quick render and key shot and uh, not to get too lost in the process of the tools. Um, you know, I just utilized just the forms and the light as a basis that I can paint on and push it further. So I don't get too lost in, uh, you know, mastering every single tool. Uh, my main tool to master is Photoshop, everything else, uh, you know, it helps supplement what I'm doing. Again, uh, I'm always trying different tools to play with. So uh, this, this was done again in Keyshot. Um, I did some, some basic 3D models and I was just playing around with uh, different textures. And the key on this one was to see uh, how close I could get to be a, a matte painting. Again, uh, like, a, like a key image, a key art that I could actually give to a client. So this one was done personally, but it's actually led to a lot of different uh, projects and job offers. So I found sometimes that doing personal work is actually a bigger calling card than actually working for a client sometimes. Um, so when you, go, when you do get into the industry and you start working, um, you're going to find that what you do for yourself tends to, tends to uh, help you land the next job. Not necessarily what you're doing at the moment for a client, but what you're doing for yourself. Okay, I'm going to stop you a second, Jason, because, and, and I'm, I love you jumping in and just start, start talking about the industry, but tell us just a little bit about your background. Tell us about, you know, first of all, where are you from? Yeah, uh, right. And what, maybe even, even a little bit, what kind of um, experience did you have educationally? What kind of kid were you? I mean, were you, were you an outdoor kid? Were you a game playing kid? Were you, um, what, what, what did you do? Well, so back in my day before computers, uh, <laughs> which is real, and um, yeah. So definitely uh, great questions, John. I was born and raised in Wisconsin, uh, so Green Bay, Wisconsin, for you all you Midwest folks. And uh, the reason why it's, it's important to know is that we get these crazy four seasons. And so I was a huge outdoor kid. Uh, I didn't stay indoors. And by the way, I'm gonna be flipping through some artwork while I'm talking. Um, if somebody has questions about what I'm showing, um, you know, definitely, you know, send it through. So um, I spent a lot of time outdoors and um, I really enjoyed just uh, skateboarding. Um, not really a sports person, but I was just more creative. I like building forts and that sort of thing. Did you draw as a kid? I did a lot. Uh, my parents didn't know why. Uh, so, um, so my family, nobody's creative. Uh, when I say that, nobody drew, nobody painted. Uh, my mom did play the piano, and that was the closest thing that came to creativity in my whole family lineage, including grandparents, aunts, and uncles. Mm -hmm. I, I was I was the oddity, to say the least. Um, they, did they, did mm -hmm. that lead you? Did that interest lead you to art school, or um... so? Yeah. Well, uh, the thing is that when I graduated from high school, and I said, "Hey, I like to go to art school," my parents went, <laughs> "Yeah, right. Really, what are you gonna do?" And I went, no, I really want to go to art school. And so the roadblock I hit is the following, is that my parents had enough finances to pay for school and I couldn't get enough student loans. So I was accepted to art school, but I financially could not go because my parents couldn't flip the bill. So what that led me to do is I went to a local university uh, when I was 18 and um, yeah, it was a general school. And to say the least, I only stayed there for about half a semester and then I dropped out. And um, so I'm, I'm essentially self-taught, man. I, I, I knew at the beginning 
that I want to work in the entertainment industry as a whole. Specifically, when I first started out, my goal was actually work within comic books. I want to be a comic book illustrator because I, I wanted to tell stories and narratives through, through pictures. That didn't work out. And, and, uh, and yeah. just, just to further that along, and I know you probably can't show the images, but tell them the sequential project you're working on right now. So oddly, um, it took only 25 years to get to where I'm at right now. Sure. Um, I, I just accepted a, a year long contract uh, to work with John Carpenter on a comic book series. So I've been working with him since last year. I worked with him on one project and I, I fulfilled and finished another project earlier this year, um, this past February. And uh, he liked it so much that um, he's like, dude, I would like for you to be full time and do some great stuff for me. So, um, so I'm now um, slated for the next year uh, to be- uh, Congratulations, that's a huge deal. Yeah, oh my God. Yes, uh, no, no, uh, no pressure, but yeah, I'm excited. Uh, super jazzed, mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, the the odd the odd excuse me the odd thing about getting to that point is that my skill set was not good enough when I was younger to work in comic books, but I had the design sensibilities. It just took mileage in terms of knowing how to create the forms. Um, since once again being self-taught, I learned all the wrong things to do, and only now that have I start to understand why they're wrong and what is the right way of getting things done in terms of basics, foundations, that sort of thing. Because honestly, as soon as you start nailing your foundations, everything else falls into play. But if you neglect your foundations, you, you neglect that hard work, no matter what you do, no matter what kind of cool tools you use, 3D, 2D, whatnot, um, you're only gonna get so far. And so um, I find you really gotta know your, your foundations. And then from there, you can re really evolve quite a bit. So, um, but yeah, but uh, so my, my initial intent was comic books. Then I, I moved in, I moved from San Francisco. I'm sorry, I moved from Wisconsin to San Francisco looking for a job. I didn't have one and eventually uh, landed a gig at a game studio. So called Brodebund. So, uh, and the reason why that's important to know is that it took about six years before I actually got my foot in the door to work at a game studio. So I moved when I was 20 and I didn't get a job until I was 26. So in the meantime, you know, I worked on, I'm not sure if you've heard of a company called White Wolf Games. They, they do a lot of vampire manuals and it's, it's essentially role-playing games. Uh, but I was, I was one of the artists working on their manuals and the reason why that's good to know is that I was, I was a professional artist, but I was being paid $15 per illustration. So um, that, that, was, that was actually below poverty wage. Um, so I had to work a full-time job. So I worked at Kinko's and worked at cafes in the meantime. And, but the, at night, you know, I, I worked after I got home from work and I kept on applying, I kept on working, kept on creating. So you got to have a bit of tooth and some sass and tenacity to work in this industry. It's not going to be a cakewalk. It's, it's definitely it's going to push you a lot uh, emotionally, physically, mentally. So, um, but yeah, but then um, after I got working into the industry, I started uh, to utilize different tools. So when I say that, you know, merge into 3D, start learning the different skill sets and start to evolve within um, different studios. When I say that, I went from doing concept design, I was a lead animator for a period of time. And I went into technical directing for a period of time. I went to art directing for a period of time. Uh, so I've worn all the multiple hats in production. And um, so, so now I'm freelance. I, I got three different clients right now I'm working with. And one of them's Magic. Another one is uh, I'm working for two different game studios. And then I just uh, took the contract job with uh, John Carpenter, which is going to and once again, that's, that's going to keep me pretty, pretty busy. And each client offers a different type of work relationship. So with John Carpenter, it's doing sequence. Uh, with one game studio, I'm doing environment design. Another studio, I'm doing character design. So um, these are all things that are things I can do, the things I love to do. And I love the versatility in that. Um, the game, the, the industry as a whole, uh, it's, they really want to pigeonhole you into was it exactly that you do? 
Um, are you character designer? Are you environment designer? Because the industry is getting more focused on one skill set. What is the, what is the thing that you do the best? That's what most studios want to see, and that's what they're going to hit you on. But once you get your foot in the door, you can actually start to expand. So let's say you love doing environment design, uh, but your true skill set is character. Well, you can actually start doing environment design once you get your foot in the door, if that makes sense. You can expand your position. Um, you can change it. So there's a bunch of personal work that I did over the years. This led to a lot of different work. Actually, I led to uh, working with uh, EA on Dead Space, ironically enough. It's kind of fitting, right? Weird, holy, strange stuff. So, so in your first job, you mentioned the, the, the game studio that you had a job with. Um, what, what, we, what was your skill set at that point? Uh, so are you uh, you're referring to uh, my first foot in the door at, at a game studio? Is that what you're right. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so this is pre-3D. So when I was hired on, I was doing orthograph uh, drawings. And so to, to share what that is, it's, it's essentially a blueprint uh, that, you know, um, animators can actually run with. So what, what that means is that I was given a design and I had to, actually, I don't have any examples because it's work I don't want to do anymore. Uh, it's, um, trust me, part of this industry as well is if, if you do something, get hired to do something, doesn't mean you should show it because you may get hired to do that type of work that you don't like. So um, anyway, so I was doing uh, the, the front side and back views and I was drawing it and I had to make sure everything lined up perfectly. So it was very, very anal retentive. Uh, then, and by the way, so this is a preview image that I did. I started working on my own narrative. And this is the work that John Carpenter saw that led to a small contract that led into a, a full year contract. So this was personal work that uh, I was creating. And um, th this is what he just, just dug. Dude, love it. He, has, he doesn't see this type of stuff currently in the comic book uh, industry, at least in the mainstream. So uh, anyway, so after I finished doing orthographs at Broderbund on this project, so this back in 98, they started to trans transition into 3D. And they asked me if I knew any, if I knew how to do 3D models or animate. I said, no, I don't. And I told them, I said, if I could use one of your computers, um, after my contract's done and come in on my own and learn the programs, um, I'll let to give it a shot. And they said, okay, cool. And I said, here's the deal. You have two weeks, here's a computer, don't bug anybody, and here's the program. And I spent essentially two weeks just playing with the pro program. And um, this is, once again, there was no documentation online. Uh, there was just a manual that you read to understand how to use the program, which is very little. And I produced a model, I rigged it, and I animated it, and I showed the art director. And he went, oh, that's pretty cool. It's like, so what did you like in the process more? I said, I, actually, I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed uh, modeling. And, um, you know, animating, like, you're hired, you're hired full time. And it turns out that um, there's so many people in the studio that were learning 3D at the time that I actually end up teaching some people in the studio how to use the program. So I became a, a technical director for a period of time because uh, I was the liaison from 2D to 3D um, and helping some traditional artists bridge that gap. And not everybody makes it. Not everybody could make that transition. I think it's different now. What was the program you were using when you first started that? It was an, er it was an early version of Moto called Lightwave. Uh, it's, a, it's the same programmer that created uh, Moto. Uh, but yeah, it was Lightwave. It was actually, I gotta say, from 3D Studio Max to Lightwave, uh, Lightwave was, was more art friendly. 3D Studio Max just makes you wanna smash your head in with a baseball bat. It's just maddening, it's crazy. It's very, very programmery, if that makes sense. So, yeah. Another, another question from Alana. Uh, since learning 3D, do you find yourself using it as a tool on a regular basis or more on an on a as, as needed basis? Uh, I would say right now I use it when I, if I cannot figure out how to make something look correct, when I say that in terms of texture, 
lighting, then I, re then I revert to 3D. Uh, but my first instinct, no matter what, is always to go 2D first, to draw it out, paint it out. And as soon as I hit that roadblock where I'm not understanding how light reacts, then I'll model, I'll model something out. And once again, you saw, let me go back to here, a case in point, you know, this is where, you know, I start to imply texture, but my main emphasis is to figure out just the way how light reacts, if that makes sense. So right now, this is more of like a glossy map, but also if, if let's say the texture is more um, matte or organic, you know, I'll throw on a different texture just to see how light reacts to it. And then once again, I'll grab that. And once again, this, the glue, I'll screen cap it and then, you know, paint on top of it and, and run with it. So it, um, so sometimes it can speed up the process. And again, if I know where I'm going with, with a piece, I, I don't use it. Um, it's, it's only, only as a, um, and well, again, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure as I become more fluid with um, different packages, I may use it more, if that makes sense. I'm going to keep asking you questions because we're getting good questions. Um, when you get a very, very vague brief, such as a, a creature, something no one has ever seen before, probably because even the director isn't sure of what it, what it should be. How do you process that information and translate that into visual concepts? Well, that's a very thought-provoking question. It's very good as well. I actually thrive on vague uh, notations and descriptions. And to me, I think that's what gives me a little bit of an edge when it comes to dealing with clients or art directors in that fashion. Because sometimes people are not sure what they're looking for. And that's once again, when, when, when people are looking towards what I'm gonna to bring to the table and they don't know what they're, what they're looking for, it's great because it's a blue sky moment. It's, it's what you think is right. Um, and this is where I really advocate in terms of art in general, is that the more you can put something in there that is you, that you love, um, that, that inspires you. So. I'll give you an example. I grew up, once again, you know, being outdoors, playing, playing around. I was always playing in the creek. Um, or always going up to the cabin somewhere. And the reason why I mentioned that is that I always loved going to the pond and fishing my hand and bringing all these different creatures and being, you know, just spazzing out. I just loved finding these, these random creatures. But I also loved nature at the same time. So I found that influence fundamentally just things I love in terms of organic. I mean, look at this stuff, especially this... Uh, you know, this is like this melted metal coral. And this is by way, it was for the, the girl with the dragon tattoo intro sequence. There's some designs I was working on. Uh, so there was that aspect. The other aspect is that when I was growing up, I loved playing video games. I loved playing role-playing games more specifically. So Dungeons and Dragons. And, and then anything that was fantasy and science fiction in terms of TV, especially films, really got me jazzed. So, um, you know, I'll give you an example. When the Rancor was coming out to eat Luke and return the, the, uh, the Jedi, I'm like, holy crap, that just blew my lid. I'm like, that is a creature that looks real. Holy crap. And um, that really, uh, I would say, fortified my interest, not only in creature design, but actually wanting to work in the industry because guess what? Somebody gets hired to make that. Somebody gets hired to fabricate it, animate it, all that. And at the time, you know, I was like, oh, I want to be a creature designer. But um, I found my skill set is that I'm very adaptive. Um, so I'm not limited just to 2D. I'm not limited to 3D. But I'm also, I'm, I'm, once again, I, I come from a background of also puppeteering on my own. And so animating is part of it. And it really comes down to the, the fundamental basis of this is all storytelling. It's all a narrative, and that's always what I've always wanted to do. So all these skill sets play into each other. Um, it's just how it gets applied to the industry. So, so back to the question. When something's vague given to me, I call upon the things that I love the most. So um, strange-looking creatures. There's a Giger alien. You know, the things that don't have eyes I find terrifying and super cool. And, um, and I always want to push the envelope, too. You know, that's why Giger was so original, because he wasn't playing safe. He was doing something distinctly new. 
And so, um, yeah, does, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. One more question here. What are some of your favorite things to create when doing your job? Some of my favorite things to create is, it's, it's actually, it's world building. And uh, so, so this, and once again, that's a big word, but uh, what that represents is the following. This comes back into the client or the art director really allowing the artist to actually have a voice, to have an opinion, to say something. And so that's where world building comes into play because uh, they call it the blue sky exploration. That, that's literally the phrase, if you haven't heard, heard it called that before, is that th there is no limit. The only limit is your imagination. And then eventually as the project starts to move forward, they have to limit what you can do. Say, no, we can't explore this, this and that. But in the beginning, the, there, there is no limit other than we want a samurai warrior in the future do something cool. And so, um, so again, so world building represents not only for, you know, what, what the, the character and creatures are, but it's, it's how the world is that influences the characters. So let's say the world is a toxic world where you can't breathe it. So that would mean that everybody would have to be breathing, wearing breathing apparatuses. Everything would have to be this locked in, so sort of secured, um, you know, places where people would live. So that would dictate, the, the environment dictates design. And so therefore you would have to completely change your approach and think innovatively about how people would exist in these environments. So dare I say, you know, it'd be in outer space and whatnot. So, um, and that within that sort of mindset that also informs how do creatures live and how do they eat and how, you know, again, environment informs everything. And uh, so as soon as I defined what the environment is and what the world is, then it's the fun part of getting to design the inhabitants that live within it. And then the characters. Usually the characters actually, um, in my opinion, usually come last uh, because because we, we, we are a reflection of the environment and then we innovate from there. So, yeah. some uh, book covers I did for Dark Horse. But yeah, so uh, world building. It's where it's at, kids. <laughs> Still there? Mm -hmm. All right, that's why I'm not sure. All right, cool. So, uh, yeah, and uh, that was done for Magic the Gathering. And this was uh, some character designs I did for Electronic Arts. Uh, it was a, a rendition of a game called Hardline and um, Cops and Robbers. So, um, so this is the non-glamorous aspect of, of producing concept design and stuff that, um, that will get covered as well in the program is that there's a lot of times where you have to create almost like, like a, what do you call it, a, a stance. You gotta just define one stance and like a paper doll. You just gotta sit there and rip out as many designs as possible. Once you rip it out, design it, produce it. You know, within a given day, um, you know, I would have I would have to produce four to six different designs and you know think texturally how they look think value wise how they look um th there's a lot of nuances that go go into costume design so so this is so there is there is an aspect of character design when i say that the person's persona but this really just goes into the fundamentals of costume design and that's a completely uh different outlook and a different beast um so so these are some of the necessities when you work in the industry especially with character design. Um, so you're not gonna always have the glamour shot. When I say that, do the one really cool pose and whatnot. And um, now, mind you, there are some artists that are so fast and so skilled that in the same amount of time that I produce my work, they can actually do these really cool poses. So, uh, so I, I'll use uh, one example, Wes, Wesley Burt. That guy draws so fast, it's insane. He's, he's such a great, he's, uh, he's truly one of the best character designers that I know of. So this was a, um, so this is another thing that, that would be covered. So this is an example of an orthographic, right? You got your front and back view. Uh, I did have a side view, but I just removed it out. And, um, and so they also have these things called call out sheets. This is where you go. So this is to define to a 3D modeler or a sculptor traditionally what the materials are. 
to further enhance. You know, this is like you know cracked leather that actually go into the base plate, and you know, is this is this sort of cloth padding that goes here, and so um, this has become pretty standard, especially for outsourcing. Is is doing the call out sheet. And this was done for a movie called. Uh, Oh my goodness, I can't remember the name of the, the movie. It was, it was about God. It's like, a, I think God, God is real. That is it. I worked on that movie, which was just bonkers. It was nutty. Uh, and the reason why I say that is that in the script, it was supposed to be about this young little girl who saw dead people and specifically people in limbo. So, so these are people who are stuck in between. They're not, so this person's just about to ascend to heaven. That's why his face is glowing. He's about to, to rapture and go up. But all these other people are stuck in, in limbo. And um, yeah, I won't go too much into the back history about Christianity, but there you go. Uh, this is done for Hellgate London. Again, uh, this is the mechanized warrior called Hunters. Here's a couple more questions for you. What 3D software do you recommend learning for concept work? Uh, let's see here. I would say at this point in time, the staple is ZBrush. It seems like everybody in, and their grandma's learning it. So, um, <laughs> man, if my grandma learns that, that'd be amazing. So, um, but yeah. Uh, so, so it's, it's ZBrush just because it is the industry standard. And um, yeah, I, I think it's good to be aware of what is being done in the industry. Uh, the other part of it is that it has been really defined and refined by artists. So it's, it's a little bit more intuitive than some other programs. Uh, but I'll, I'll give you an example of what I do use. So I use ZBrush. Um, I, I occasionally use uh, 3D Studio Max. I, I tend to use that for more for rigging and, and for animating. And I use SketchUp as well. Uh, SketchUp, once again, I'm pretty sure you guys know, it's, it's a free program. And you know, it's accessible, it's great. Uh, also, ZBrush has its own little uh, side program called Sculptress that's also free to use as well. So if you don't have the budget, um, if you can't get a license um, in terms of financing, use those programs and those free to use. Uh, so I would recommend, and once again, Sculptress is owned by ZBrush. It's just, it's just a, a, a streamlined, simplified version of ZBrush. Good, that, that's good to know. Um, how do you market your work in a way that art directors of different studios can approach you and your work doesn't get lost in the sea of other amazing arts? That, my friend, is the riddle. And uh, so how initially, so this, this is pre-internet. And the reason why I'm saying that, because the kickoff was you had to go to where these people are located. So when I say that, I had to move from Wisconsin to here to be in front of these people. It's the right place at the right time. And I think that statement is still holding true in this industry, in this time. Uh, there, there are going to be people who stand out. So art station, whatnot, you know, cream of the crop. They're going to get discovered. It's going to be fantastic. The rest of us are going to be in a sea of being lost. Um, so how I've gotten around that is, um, so pre-internet, I would go to different events. So whether it be Gen Con, Comic Con, um, now there's all these different workshops too you can go to. Um, so, um, so back in the day, you know, Massive Black would have these workshops and they would invite not only people who work in the industry, but they would actually have other people that would come and actually look at portfolios and do portfolio reviews. So the key to me, and I would advocate to you, is to be present physically be at shows, meet people face to face, because it, it's, it's very, very strange, but I do believe in this philosophy, is that if you're a cool person and you get a good skill set and somebody likes you, guess what? Chances are you probably will get a job. That person will probably go out of the way because they like you enough that it's almost like family. Like, hey, you're a cool kid, let me help you out. And um, you're the one in the family. And so when I initially landed my first job, was because I was friends with somebody that I met um, at the, the university for, for one semester. So he liked me and uh, years later he contacted me and when he knew that I was in San Francisco, he's like, I'm working for this studio, we need somebody right now and you're perfect. 
So it was that friendship. So A number one, so schools will provide friendships. Friendships will provide opportunities that could lead to that job. So once you get in the industry, not only do friends help you get a job um, because you like each other, uh, the other aspect is once you're working in the industry, the people you work with uh, directly, whether it be programmers, modelers, animators, be cool, man. That's my keyword, be cool. The reason why is that every place I've been at, um, I mean, I'll just randomly would talk to people and they would leave that job and I would get a call saying, hey dude, they need somebody. They need a concept designer and I thought of you. Are you interested? And they would hook me up and I get a job interview and I get a job. And I and it went from initially great, the, the most difficult aspect is getting that first job. And once you get that job, you can uh, lily pad from place to place. You know, I did that for about 15 years. Uh, and then I went freelance, holy crap, different beast. So, um, so back to the root of the conversation, to stand out, you still have to be viably available, social media, because you never know, you may post an image at the right place at the right time. Let's say if you post it through ArtStation, uh, once again, just uh, as an example. It may be the first thing up there, enough people click on it, it trends, an art director sees that, that's exactly the style we want, get hired. So if that doesn't happen, then the other aspect is be present. Go to shows, present your portfolio, meet fellow artists, interact, engage. Um, that, uh, honestly, that, that's what keeps me employed. That's what keeps, at least that's how it's been working for me personally. Because uh, honestly, I mean, when I go to ArtStation, I'll be very direct with, with everybody. It is overwhelming. It is saturating and it's, it's almost defeating because, because everybody's doing something so prolifically mind-blowing that it's like, how, how do I compete against this? And guess what? Well, not everybody is able to go to these shows. Not everybody can meet these art directors. But if, you're in, if you are in the United States and you save up money and you go meet these people, you're going to stand out over a lot of really bonkers, crazy people on art station. I guarantee it. So this is uh, some concept design I did for Magic the Gathering. This is the Eldrazi creatures I was talking about. This is the moment where somebody asked earlier, what if you're giving some vague information and you design? The information I got to design these creatures was the following. We need an alien creature that's not Giger alien. So in other words, you know, like, um, you know, phallic and dark and strange. Uh, we want an alien that's not a gray alien, and we want something that's imposing, but yet um, approachable. So that was the information they gave me. And this is the stuff I came up with. It's just, and I spent about, about two months. So this is one page out of 20, um, you know, where I was just throwing different ideas. Like what if, you know, what if these creatures are able to defy gravity and have these glyphs and these rocks embedded into their flesh and uh, the key word that I really gravitated towards for designing these creatures was uh, fractals. Things are subdividing. There's a, you know, so one limb, one limb becomes two. Um, I love anything that, that looks one shape and can transform into another shape. So that's why transformers are so cool. <laughs> Robots in disguise. So, uh, yeah. Couple more questions, Jason. Yes. Um, do you have any tips for designing armor or things like it? Hmm. Any, any tips? I'm sorry, you dropped out just for a moment. Any tips for what? Uh, do you have any tips for designing armor and things like it? I guess parts yeah. of things like that. Yeah, yeah. So tips for yeah. for 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 armor is a number one. Fundamentally. What is the time period? What is the location? Um, so when I say that, is it Ito, Japan? Is it uh, China? Is it Mongolia? Um, is, it, is it medieval Europe? Uh, you know, once again, is it Aztec? You know, so in and one, when I say that, I'm just using the big words in terms of time periods and different cultures and locations, because each culture has a different shape language, right? And so fundamentally, there, there, there are going to be shapes that we love. That we look at. I mean, I, when I look at medieval plate mail, I'm like, holy crap, what were they smoking? Amazing. And um, then I look at Japan armor, and when I look at the, the intricacies of the details, 
it blows my mind, right? So there's, um, so number one, know your time period. Number two, know your, your narrative. So what is your character about? Where does he live? What is the time period? So all those things come into factor. Uh, what will give your design the edge, at least what I tried to do, is that th there has to be new ways of, there is say juxtaposing things that don't belong together. So when I say that, cool, medieval armor, but what if there was, what if medieval armor in terms of European medieval armor was influenced by Japanese culture? Like, how would that still be European, but how would the influence of Japanese culture change the design? Would it change the shape language of what you're doing? Or would it change the details of what, how the, the uh, armor is embellished? Uh, it might be a little bit of both. So, so the key word is, is to use a base uh, of, of certain armor design and then to juxtapose it with something that hasn't been done before or see how it can be influenced by something that has been influenced before. And I think that's the key to design in general, where it comes from fashion, uh, game design, anything else. There's, there's gotta be something distinctly, something original about it. And when I say original, it's, it's to showcase a, a new take on an old idea. And then again, so well. Uh, yeah, so if that, hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully that helps out. Research, of course, please. Do your research. I guess, you know, and uh, that's the thing that I'm not sure if uh, you've ever discussed this. What makes uh, doing concept design a really fun aspect is actually half the fun is actually researching. You get to learn so much. You get to learn about environments, you get to learn about characters, ecosystems. You become a very worldly person. I guarantee it. Because once again, you go, go into armor, start to read about how armor is made, why it was made. How does it function? And um, again, the key word for, for most design is form follows function. And, and by the way, so, so this imagery I'm showing you right now, this is, uh, so I've been working with a new program. It's called the uh, Mandelbalber. So it's a 3D fractal, uh, alder, I can't say the right word. It's, a, it's formulaic, to say the least. So rather than actually modeling the actual geometry, I'm actually, using different fractal, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to describe. You're using numbers rather than actual sculpting itself and it defines these repeated shapes. So you're gonna see this showing up in um, entertainment industry, especially in feature film. It's already started, but you're gonna see a lot of this happening more and more. So I already know certain trends are, are gonna be trending and I know why too. So um, this was done for, uh, for Electronic Arts. This was actually, a, an, a, I did five different pitch proposals for EA while I was there for about three years. And um, all of them got, you know, they weren't funded. So this is one of those, the, one of those moments where it was a blue sky, the zombie apocalypse, but how would you do a little bit of a different spin? So my spin was not only would everything be boarded up, but also thought about the, the, the stark contrast of color. So when I say that the, when you squint, the predominant thing you're seeing is like more of like a bone color and bone white, and it has splashes of red. So it's a very stark contrast. Uh, there's something very foreboding about it. You also think about as well, um, just the way everything's lacing and it's plastic. It also has this sort of feeling that everything's encased, almost like a, like a cobweb. I'm not sure if you've seen on a tree, uh, like a big encased cobweb where it's full of, you know, like a little uh, there are, say, caterpillars or maggots. Disgusting. It's freaky. And so um, so these are the type of things that I try to embellish and add into uh, my designs as, as a subconscious narrative. And this was done for uh, Dante's Inferno. That was another project that was in previs. Uh, I got a year into development, and then it was uh, the project was pulled. But this was a fun project. Uh, I was, was the key artist on this. When I, when I say key artist, all I did was I provided different vistas and landscapes. Um, and then production would say, cool, all right, now we're gonna design and figure out what this cathedral is and they're gonna go inside and figure out all the details. So, but my, my goal, or actually my job was just pitch ideas to inspire and then production would actually figure out the rest of the details. Again, it was, it was great. It was dead dead space.
Another portfolio question. Uh, when presenting a portfolio during an in-person event, mm -hmm. do you recommend having a book of prints or a website or both? Hmm. Okay. So if you're presenting your portfolio to somebody who has been in the industry for a while, and I, I wish this is, I wish I was joking around, but it's true. So let's say if you're, if you meet an art director and they're, let's say 45 to 50 or above, they're going to respect the crap out of you. If you have your portfolio printed because they love print, they love it. They can look at it. They can understand it. But honestly, what works the best is to actually have an, a digital tablet, something that's handheld, accessible, easy. Um, what I do and, and what has worked in the past wonderfully is that, uh, that what I would do is that I would, so I'm pretty sure you know this already, usually portfolios, no more than 10 pieces maximum, because uh, most art directors will decide whether or not you're fit. Um, or if it's what they're looking for. So 10 pieces or less, your best of the best. Exactly what is it that you do, what you love, whatever else. So that showcases you. Then I would have another portfolio where if you go into an event, for example, so, um, and you know you're gonna meet, let's say an art director from Blizzard, then I would cater your portfolio to what they're looking for. Because Blizzard wants to see Blizzard material. They wanna see World, World of Warcraft, they wanna see Starcraft, Diablo, you kind of get the idea. And not only do they want to see if you understand their property, but they also want to see uh, if you can bring something new to their ideas. So looking for two things. Can you adapt to what we design and can you innovate on uh, things that we haven't thought of? If that makes sense. So yeah, so, so multiple portfolios on the digital tablet is a smart way to go. Because if you go to an event and you're gonna be meeting multiple people, you never know who you're gonna meet. And depends on who you meet, certain people are looking for certain things. So that's where I usually have about anywhere from two to five, each portfolio has 10 pieces, usually two to five portfolios, and they're catered specifically to certain uh, industries. So one would be for feature film, one would be for video game development, and one would be for publication, and then another one would be like the best of the best. And that one would be what I love to do. Again, so, um, so it's, it's excellent question. And um, yeah, I would say that that's the best way to go in terms of being prepared. And honestly, um, you know, being able to quickly offset. Cause I'll give you last example. If an art director is looking through your portfolio and they say, cool, I love this image. I want to see more of this work. Well, guess what? It should be on your laptop. So let's say, or not your laptop, but uh, your tablet. So let's say they, they really love your character design. Well, guess what? You should have a portfolio or you should have a folder with more examples of that specific style, ready to go at a heartbeat's notice. Same with environment, same with illustration. So um, again, it's being dutifully prepared for the unknown. Um, it's, it's the best way to go, in my opinion. Uh, Jason, it's very similar from the illustration point of view of what we re really point our students in identifying their audience, identifying who the art directors are they want to work for, what mm -hmm. titles they work on, so you, can, so you can develop work aimed at what their needs are. And yes. And that's, that's understanding the industry. And it, it's, it, has, it will save years uh, in, in chasing your tail, trying to get started in the industry. Very much so. Yeah, it's, uh, it's huge. And, um, but it, the key is uh, I, I definitely had very specific ideals and goals. To give you an example, when I moved to San Francisco, my goal initially was not to work in game development. It was actually, I wanted to work for ILM. I came to San Francisco specifically to work for Ireland. And uh, now here's the odd things that I came out here for that. I've never landed a job working for Ireland. I've interviewed there three separate times. I'm like so close, but no. But the thing is that the most amazing, unexpected things happened. I worked in different game studios. I learned how to animate. I learned how to 3D model. 
I've done everything possible for production within game development. And, um, you know, that led, it, led itself to having the ability to actually explore my own work, explore my own voice. And uh, I found that as I got older, the more experience I got, the more I was able to refine my skill set. I found that um, defining a narrative, having a voice, and when I say that, sometimes you could define that voice by, by illustrating. Sometimes you can define that voice by writing, maybe both. I found, once again, this image, Salvage. This was the defining moment for me where people went, oh, you're not a production artist. You actually are an artist. You have a voice. This led to so many different jobs. And once again, this project that I did for myself, I fund, I, not only did I create the artwork on my own, it was just an itch I wanted to scratch. Stuff that I did outside of work, of course. Um, I self-published the book. I got a distribution deal with, um, I'm pretty sure you can see, with Insight and Random House. So I paid for the print run. Uh, I was able to get in contact with these guys and they distributed my book. And what that led to is that my book got into every um, studio you could possibly imagine. Because uh, Insight is, is a very big brand name. Uh, they do a lot of IP tie-ins. I mean, type in Inside Editions and look at all the art books. I guarantee you, top-notch books, man. So, um, and since I was underneath that umbrella, my book got into all the different game studios, movie studios. You could possibly imagine. Artists were buying my book and giving it to their art directors, production designers. So, this project led to a four-year contract working with EA specifically to define new IPs for them because they liked my style. Uh, it led to working on Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Uh, that was um, with uh, Tim Miller and um, David Fincher. By the way, the new series, Love and Death and Robots on Netflix is amazing. So, you know, I worked with those guys and uh, I'm still in touch with them. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, and then actually the last job I had, when I say I had that from this work that led to a contract job is that I was working directly with Ian McKay on a film project. He specifically called me and said, Jason, I love your work. We need to work together. And of course, I said, yes. I was uh, super jazzed. So uh, I worked with him uh, exclusively for a couple months and um, I helped him pitch a couple different uh, film projects and he got hired on as a director on a film. And so I was his go-to man in terms of concepting uh, for his project. And so, so right now he, he's in, so the project has been put on hold temporarily, but the thing is that I got to work with Ian McKay. How cool is that? I got to work with David Fincher. What the hell? So um, now, now I'm working with John Carpenter and it all, and all this work became because of the following. This project, of course, having experience in industry. So salvage led to what I just talked about. And the other personal work that I did is, is this comic series where I was just experimenting and playing around. So, you know, the, I was writing and drawing my own um, graphic novel and I only got 12 pages in and then it, it became too much. But the thing is that John Carpenter saw this and that led to um, the current contract I have right now. So again, the emphasis is that what I did for myself opened so many more doors. And the emphasis is also because of what I had to say and my standpoint of what I think is cool and what I want to say in terms of an artist visually um, led to these doors being opened. So, so the, there, is, there is the need to being market ready, when I say that, being able to produce artwork that can fit a production role. And then there's the, the other aspect, which is, do you want to be a production artist? In other words, always being told what to do. If so, great, focus on that. But if you want to innovate from there and actually being seen as a creator, a content provider, um, someone who has a voice, then you need to keep on pushing. And when I say keep on pushing, even if you get your day job at night, you got to be working on your own stuff again. Uh, so it's, uh, you never stop paying your dues. Never. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, it's, uh, I just turned 45 this year and uh, I feel like I, I've definitely, it's, it's, I haven't had as much work as I had up to this moment in time and I've never felt so overwhelmed um, in a good way, is that there's a lot of pressure when we get hired to do a job. There's a lot of pressure to constantly perform. 
and there's a lot of pressure to not be in one place but constantly evolving um, not only career wise but also skill wise um, so fortunately uh, if you really 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 love um, what's again art especially concept design and art in general it, it's it's not um, necessarily a job it's a lifestyle if you're really committed to what the industry is and something that you live and love uh, and it is your life then then you'll do just fine um, but if, if it's like oh something i would like to try um, it's going to be a, a much more difficult road unless you're just you know amazing um, you know, intuitive so these are some uh, designs i did for this is for the core of the dead project so um so they wanted me to define a grin reaper like how can we do a little bit of a different take on the Grim Reaper? So again, this is the whole thing. I, I love having multiple arms. So this is the arms within arms. Uh, the the suit itself is actually, you know, stitched together flesh and made into like a sort of cloth suit. Got some medieval armor here that's all flipped around and duplicated. So yeah. And uh, the, the other thing that makes this industry fun and difficult at the same time, you're going to produce a lot of artwork that probably will never see the light of day. And you're also going to be producing a lot of artwork that gets thrown out. So um, unfortunately, you can't get too overly precious about um, what people think and do with your work. You have to take pride in what you do and do the best you can. But if people don't like it, sometimes you can't. I want to say sometimes. You have to allow that not to be a personal reflection of you. Unless you're, you're just really bailing, you're doing like a really, really bad job, like your, your skill set's just floundering, then there's problems. But, um, you know, if something says like, oh, we're not thinking this idea, you know, there's not much you can do. And trust me, I've worked with a lot of art directors that said, well, it's not what I'm thinking when I would show them a design. And then my question would be, okay, so what are you thinking? And they would say, I don't know. but I know when I see it. And you know what happens when that happens? That means the art director has no idea what they're looking for. They have no clue because they're not able to give you direction because they have no idea what direction to give you. So that can be very, very uh, difficult to deal with. But guess what? It's probably going to happen and you're probably going to have to deal with it. Um, so here's, so yeah. here's a question that goes with that. What are some of the pros and cons about working in the industry? You just explained a few. Yeah, uh, well, the, the pros is that, dude, you're, you're working on games and films, so yay. <laughs> and you're not, and uh, you're no longer broke. Fantastic. And you get accreditation, and you get to uh, be part of one of us. Does that make sense? Like, you know, you finally, um, it's, it's interesting, like, as soon as you start, when I say you, as an artist, as soon as you get paid, to create artwork, uh, there, there's some validation in getting paid. It feels great. I won't lie. My first job and finally getting paid and no longer being broke was the most amazing feeling in my entire life. Because I was validated that I, my skill set was good enough. Uh, I was validated that people liked me enough. And, um, and the fact that financially I wasn't struggling anymore, oh, it was such a beautiful feeling. And then after that fades, then, then it starts to fade into, oh, this is a job. And um, so, so the, the contrast is that you, there's gonna be times where you're gonna be working at a studio and you're not gonna be in the project. You're not gonna be into the job. So I'll give you an example. When I was at uh, Mattel, so I was working at the studio for about two years and I was working on a really, really cool project. It was Prince of Persia. I was working on the Prince of Persia series and uh, having a great time. And then um, I got pulled aside because like, oh, we want to do more pitch art for new properties. And so they started looking at the, the umbrella of what Mattel is. And like, oh, Mattel, hey, we have Barbie. We want to do a Barbie Malibu racing video game. And we need for you to do the, we need for you to do the pitch proposal artwork for Malibu Barbie racing. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it went from, cool Prince of Persia hacking and slashing and these Arabian beautiful landscapes to a pink Ferrari and Barbie blowing down the street, racing other Barbie looking girls. And I had to illustrate that. It, 
it, it was the most demoralizing moment for me because I was like, man, over there on the next cubicle over, somebody's working on Prince of Persia and now I'm working on Malibu Barbie. Mm -hmm. so, the, so I was really un, unhappy and pissed off because I felt that I was robbed and be taken away of, of the project that I loved working on. And then the reality came down to it is that it's a job and we're not always going to get the, the work we want. We're not always going to work on the projects that we love. And fortunately, the ups and downs of this is that um, nothing's forever, right? So if you're working on something that's really crappy, well, guess what? In due time, you will be working on something that you're really jazzed about. And then it's a reminder, like, ah, this is why I do this. Ah, this is why I love doing this. Is working on those really, really cool projects. And last thing I'll say about it is if you don't get to work on those projects, then that's when personal work becomes the cornerstone of salvation. And that's what led to me working on, on salvage is that I was not being fulfilled at the studio working on the projects I was working on for a period of time. And can I tell you that that, that was a, a blessing in disguise, to say the least, it is, is to, um, to take the energy and have the energy to feel unfulfilled at work and to fulfill that at home. So again, that, that's where um, you're constantly creating. This, this question is kind of similar to that, but can maybe broaden a little bit. Speaking of which, how do you keep your skills from stagnating when you're working full time, either for a non art job or an art job that isn't challenging your creativity? So how do you keep from stagnating? Is that uh, the, the root of the, the question? Yes, that's, yes. The, that's it. Yeah. Um, a perfect way to, uh, to look at it is the following. If you stagnate, chances are you're going to be unemployed. <laughs> so I fear starvation. I fear uh, not being able to pay for rent. So that keeps me moving forward. And it sounds really weird to say the word fear, uh, but fear can be two different things. Fear can be a motivator or it can hinder you. So I use fear as, as a way to empower me. I, I use it as a motivator. So that's why a fear has a stigma, stigmata, where like, oh, you should never fear. You know, you should prolifically and triumphantly, you know, overcome any obstacle. Yes, I agree to a certain degree. Uh, and um, so I, I think I think part of it, once again, this industry is, uh, which what makes it hard is that um, we're constantly looking at our skill set, which we're, we're constantly judging ourselves against other people, and we're constantly self-doubting our ability to create. And um, and so it's it's, it's all it's, so that's where again uh, the other thing that keeps me moving forward besides the word fear is uh, for myself when I'm doing personal work it's more of a then it comes curiosity. So this piece I did is because I was not working on anything that was a narrative. I was just doing straight production. I was designing consoles. I was designing doors and doorways and you know, things that people would want to chew on a bullet and you know, call it a day. Um, very, very unsatisfying work. But can I tell you when you do something that you're really into, um, it pushes you. It, it excites you. reminds you why you do it. And, and for me, uh, the, the biggest thing that keeps me from stagnating is that I know fundamentally that I have so much to learn. Like what, what you see currently right now, uh, what I've been flipping through and constantly kind of scrolling through is, is this is a, a, a little small ounce of the work I've done. And, um, and I feel like I've, I've, I feel like only now am I getting close to where I would want to be visually. I'm getting close, but I still have a lot to learn. And so the closer I get to achieving a visual um, look, and the biggest thing I struggle with as, as an artist is that I've always had ideas. The imagination has always been the, the big cornerstone for me. I've always had ideas. What I was limited by was my ability to create my ideas. I have very vivid dreams. I have very vivid ideas. Uh, but it's always the fight of how can I get that to come out of my head? And the more the tools evolve, 3D, the more um, I evolve and learn 2D, and the more I can bridge those together, it's really exciting because uh, cause, cause now, uh, so once again, back to 
sequential art, working with John Carpenter, um, you know, that has unified everything I've been been showing you, which is character design, environment design, um, and back down to this narrative. Every panel has to communicate a narrative in sequential. And um, and it went went back to my roots of where I wanted to be when I first started in the industry. I wanted to tell stories, and I wanted to visually dictate and define stories. And so, um, yeah, so, so it's been great. And so, so now working with John Carpenter, I know after this next year, working with him exclusively, is that um, my skill set is going to evolve tremendously because it's no longer production. It's no longer straight concept design. It's now fabricating compelling stories. Um, it's going to push my production. It's going to push my concept designs. It's going to push all that into a completely new level. And if, if anything else, it makes me realize that actually I have stories that actually I want to draw and illustrate. And so my next step from, from here is that I'm going to be pitching my own ideas. I'm going to see if I can get John Carpenter to actually pay me to write and draw my own comic book and that he can publish um, and be underneath his umbrella. Um, so so that would be my, my goal is, is to be seen as, as a creator, uh, not just a content provider, you know? Okay, I'm going to ask one more question that's from the lineup. Is there anything you do to help prevent burnout? Is there, is there anything to do what? Sorry? To help prevent burnout? Burnout. No, it's going to happen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's, but prevention is key. Absolutely. So, uh, so burnout is, is a tricky beast because the reason why I am hesitating about how to answer this question, because it's tricky. So when I, so give you my past experience. When I was at um, Nihilistic Software, Nihilistic was actually in conjunction working with uh, Blizzard Entertainment. So I was, also, I was working on StarCraft Ghost, which became StarCraft II. When I was on the project, the team size was 35 people for a AAA game. So not only was I concepting, I was animating and I was modeling and I was doing in-game cinematic um, storyboards and direction. So I was doing all that. And um, then the studio, on top of working on that project, took on another, another uh, so they were hired by Marvel Studios to do a fighting game. And the studio decided not to increase the, uh, the amount of people working on staff. They kept it at 35. So rather than doing one game, we are now doing two games. And uh, I spent six months, uh, I was working on average about 12 or 14 hours a day. And I did that for seven days a week for six months. And, um, and I hit a point where my relationship was awful. Uh, my morale was awful. I, I was just a really crappy person. I was just so burnt out, just so fed up. And I remember going to work and just, told my art director, I said, you got two weeks, uh, I'm out, I'm done. And, um, and, and his response was, go ahead, be a quitter. Everybody else is, is gonna stay here and work harder. So the industry unfortunately has this machismo, which is um, you're gonna have studios they're gonna, they're gonna push and may find that breaking point. And there's times when um, you're not gonna be able to say no. And if you're gonna be able to say no, then you're, you're far more farther than myself because by saying no, chances are you're gonna be fired. And so, so there, there is this sense of fear uh, of losing your job by speaking up. Studios are getting better about this. The industry has changed dramatically since that experience. That was back in 2004. So, you know, it's been what, 15 years ago? So, uh, so but I went through that. And I, after I experienced burnout, it was the worst thing I could ever imagine because I didn't care about artwork. I didn't care about anything. All I wanted to do was sleep, eat, watch some TV, um, but I, I was hollow. So, so going forward, now I work freelance. Now I'm in control of my schedule. And so how I avoid burnout now is that I have to be very disciplined about when I'm working and when I'm not working. You're really gonna have to really define that valve for yourself. And um, so if you're in that position, then you're in control. And if you're not in that position, then um, in the studio's pushing you to that breaking point, 
Um, that's something where either the studio is not a good place for you or you need to find a new place to work because that's not healthy and um, nobody wins in that situation, if that makes sense. So, um, so if it's in your control, then make sure you, you define a schedule and stick with it. And um, yeah, if you're in that, 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 that job situation I described, um, you know, try to find options before it's too late. But you can rebound from, from burnout though. You can rebound from it, but um, it sucks. I, I highly, if you can get around it, you're, you're gonna be far better off. Yes, but excellent question though. It's, uh, it's something that's really not talked about that much in the industry. Uh, movie studios have, have a tendency to really burn people out really fast. Uh, the, film in, the film industry is way more intense than um, the video game development for the most part. And my experience with film development has always been on a contract basis. So I never was in the trenches, uh, but I have enough friends who worked in studios full time um, where I've heard a lot of horror stories about uh, the working conditions. When I say the working conditions, it's just that you're a contractor, you got three to six months to do something, and the things that if they throw a ton of work on your lap and you want to work with, let's say ILM, again, you just have to do the work. You have to put in the extra hours. You have to put in that time. Because if you don't, not only do you get a bad reputation, you don't get hired again, uh, but you know that could travel, that can haunt you to your next job. So it's, it's, a, it's a tricky one, it really is. But excellent question though. So is there, um, so as I was paging through some of this artwork, was there any pieces um, that people want to see more of? Again, I've just been flipping through all this different stuff. This is, by the way, this is magic again. This thing went through so many iterations. And the thing is that when it gets printed, if you can see how it scrolls down, this, this is how big the artwork actually appears when it gets printed. So all this detail, nah. <laughs> Nobody gets to see all this stuff. This is a gnarly dude. So if anybody saw the movie John Carpenter, The Thing, um, ironically enough, it's, it's, it's a homage to that where faces are splitting and things are coming out of things. So also I, I try to, at least with magic, I try to make my stuff as refined. When I say stuff, I try to make my artwork as refined as possible because um, so in terms of what magic does, they print it as this size, right? So all they care about is the card, it being printed, and it's done. It's very rarely ever used any other context. So the reason why I go hog wild on this is because I can actually put this in my portfolio and I can show this to, um, you know, I can show this to ILM, I can show this to a production studio and they can see, oh cool, he's working with photorealist, photorealistic textures, this is really tangible. I mean, this could be a concept design, um, you know, for a project, for a studio. And a lot of studios now, in my opinion, especially when it comes to feature film, they're looking for this type of presentation. They want not only to see the character fully realized, they want to see how the texture is applied to the character in terms of a photoreal way, but they also want to see how light interacts with it. And the last context is how it fits into the environment. So, um, Again, you pick up any art book now, especially for Marvel movies, majority of the times when you have character designs and everything else, it's always a character with a really cool backdrop now. So it almost looks like a, it got polished illustration to a certain degree. So you're not gonna see as much of this um, in studios, especially in, in film, you're gonna see more stuff like this. Iterations of this creature with this sort of look. That was done for magic. Yeah, a, question, a real quick question. Uh, what was the fighting game called? The one the studio made for Marvel? Mm, I will I think it was called. So this came out in, to remember the time frame of when the game was actually in development versus published. It was in production 2002, and I think it came out in 2004, 2005. So I think it might have been Marvel Alliance, I think. That might have been it. Yeah. But I'll tell you something crazy, though, when I was on that project, is that when we got, so this is back in 2002, they gave us a list 
of all the movies that they had intended to make from uh, from then until uh, 2018. They had over 30 movies listed and they had prerequisites of characters that needed to be in the fighting game to mirror the future movies that are going to come out. So Marvel was that far in advance already about how far they're going to push. They had such blind faith that the movies are going to make a killing, that they're going to do a fighting game and they already have, you know, they had 20 scripts ready to go to be filmed. So great prediction, you know, man, it was really crazy. So again, the, the name of the, the game I'm going on is, is Marvel Fighting Alliance, but I, I, that doesn't sound right with them. Anyways, yeah, if you, if you type in nihilistic games, Marvel fighting game, I'm pretty sure through Google, uh, it'll probably pop right up. Yeah, but those, uh, those, but those, but those were some strange days though. Uh, and then, so ironically, when I put in my two week notice at nihilistic and, um, you know, working on the game. So I was working on ghost and working on the, the Marvel fighting, fighting game. Uh, I would say three weeks later, uh, Starcraft Ghost was taken away from Nihilistic and given to Swinging Ape. That was down in LA. Then Swinging Ape was actually bought out by um, Blizzard Entertainment. And then Blizzard took over Starcraft Ghost, and then they just uh, they took all the assets and uh, reused it. And uh, part of the assets that were were used were were used for Starcraft Two, and the rest of the game was just canceled. And um, so technically, yeah, most of the artwork that I was, I was doing on StarCraft Ghost was used in StarCraft II, which is awesome. Uh, but I never got full credit for it. But when I talked to art director, he, he gave, me some, uh, gave me some gang signs. Like, dude, you're the real gangster. I'm like, yeah. By the way, StarCraft II is awesome. <laughs> and I think I have some of the, the early, uh, if you're curious. So by the way, some... Uh, are you guys are you able to see, um, I'm looking at my website right now. Are you able to see this? I would assume yes, right? Yes. Okay, cool. Right on, thanks. Uh, so as you can see, if we go to here to uh, projects, concept artwork, I have listed as far as what I can show, um, all the projects I worked on. Um, and so down here, StarCraft Ghost, this is, this is back in 2000 and 2002. So this is when from the, the preliminary concept designs I was doing for for the Dark Templars and the Protoss and so yeah but back when everything was too uh, in terms of drawing everything was just uh, drawn out and painted yeah but it was, it was a really fun project though I had a really great time and and so I, I was actually on that project for uh, it was in development for four years before it was taken away from nihilistic. Swing and Ape was working on it for another two years. Uh, so that went on to six year development. And then when Blizzard took it on, it was in development for another two years. So it was in a eight year cycle and they still canceled it. So Blizzard is notorious for um, allowing things to be in production hell, as they would call it, and then canceling it. And it's nutty. So, um, so w when I was actually working on uh, Ghost, I was also defining certain assets that were done for StarCraft, the first game. And just to share with you, StarCraft, the first game, didn't have any tangible concept designs. There was some character design and some creature design, but all the assets that were made were actually were made um, in production. In other words, we need to make, you know, let's say the Spore Colony, they made it in-game. Um, they, they didn't concept it, they just produced it. So when I had to actually going and redefine these and these had to be you know like three quarters and had to be handed off from production and be 3d modeled on the project that goes on um you know i really was just working with these little snapshots of what i could see on screen looking at pixels to redefine what was what was there so yeah but crazy so yeah so um that that was some of the production work I did on that project. And then once again, after I finished that, then I went to storyboarding and then doing animation and then models. So it's a little bit. And the, the main reason why, if you go through my, my website, uh, the main reason why you're not gonna see animation and 3D models up here for the most part is because I don't wanna be hired for that anymore. Um, I'm proud of it. I think I'm a really skilled animator. I think I'm, I'm a, I'll say savvy enough modeler, but I just don't wanna be hired for that stuff anymore. 
So I want to be hired as a designer, if that makes sense. So that's, uh, so the industry can pigeonhole you into certain things. So um, my, I would say going forward, regardless if you're working in the industry or not, make sure you are showing the work that, that you love to do that really reciprocates the direction you want to go in. Because if you start creating artwork, but you're not into it, but you're doing it to build your portfolio, there may be that chance where you might get that job, but guess what? You'll be working on things that you don't want to do and you may get stuck into a, a job that you can't get out of. It sounds, it sounds weird, but it, it, it happens. So Elder Scroll, this is another project that was on. This was uh, Benthsoft. And this is the project I worked with uh, E. McKay on. So we're doing um, in-game cinematics. And um, so this is the key art um, that was used for the project. And they really want to go for the photo reel. So it was like literally photos smashed together and then put together and yeah. So Ian McKay was sending me thumbnails of the storyboards and then it was up to me to, to finish them. And I was given per finish image, I was given one day to finish each image. So um, not a lot of time. Um, so uh, fortunately, because, um, so for example, the lead character and a lot of the characters in the backdrop, you know, I, I formulaically created all these robed characters in the back and I could repopulate them in different scenes. So once I actually got some of the foundation done, um, it, was, it was a bit easier to replicate some, some of the actual sequences. Um, the main character himself, uh, we, we did actually spend some money. When I said we, so Ian McKay um, and uh, some people over at his studio uh, hired some actors and they photographed them. And so I was able to get some assets to work with. So, so the character didn't have all the armor, so I had to add armor and whatnot. But the point is, is that some production, some production way of working, it can be quick and fast and iterative, but certain studios will supply certain assets um, to facilitate a quicker turnaround. Some studios will give you nothing and you have to figure it out. <laughs> so uh, yeah, again, it's, uh, it's crazy. Another quick question, Jason. When yep. working with more realistic texture and presentation, do you photo bash, incorporate, uh, incorporate actual photograph textures or paint them by hand? Uh, so, the, so to answer your question, definitely photo bash. So uh, here's the deal. I find that um, photo bashing is, it was for the longest time a taboo. You go to any, any studio now, is not a taboo. It's just the way things get done. Matte painting, what do you think that is? Um, you know, I go on and on. Uh, it's, it's, rel it's used often. It's no longer taboo. It's, it's all, so what, what it comes down to now is your skill set to provide an idea and unify the vision of it. So if you don't know how to utilize photos to accentuate what you're creating, um, no matter how many photos you throw at something, it's, it's going to look bad. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. so, um, so, so definitely per project, you know, from, once again, this, this was, they want photo, photo reel. So th this, this was crucial. This was some of the, the, the designs they're doing for the masks, uh, some 3D stuff. But, um, you know, so for this project, it was mandatory. You know, we had to, uh, there were, there's no way about it. Horror of the Dead. Please, when it came down to these designs, you know, they're, they're like, we don't care how you achieve it, just draw it, paint it, but we, we don't necessarily need it to be photo real. We just want some really, really cool designs, if that makes sense. So I was using um, some armor textures and um, some armor plates that really sell the division of texture, uh, but it wasn't crucial, it wasn't mandatory. Uh, that was a vista I created. Um, that was definitely photo bashing as well, but uh, that was on my own. Again, uh, so, so yeah, it's uh, it's. I'll say the way the industry has evolved, for the most part. So this is a uh, Magic the Gathering. You can see all my thumbnails. This is this is the core. This was all hand drawn and painted, and then photo textures were added on top of it. But guess what? I already had the design done. So photo textures were only selling how tangible the design is, if that makes sense. And again, so that, that's where the original drawing, I mean, it's there, but they want it rendered 
they want a certain look. So, uh, so, so put this way, I think 3D tools and photo bashing is a means to an end, but the core, and I think any designer will agree with me on this, is that you fundamentally have to be, uh, your foundations have to, be pretty, have to be rock solid. You have to be able to design. And um, so, so then these different ways of working are just an extension of providing a quicker resolution. Um, we could all sit down to hand paint and look at photographs and not use photographs. Well, guess what? They'll take a week or you can produce a piece in a day. Um, that's a big, big difference, right? And uh, fortunately and unfortunately, uh, the industry has dictated we need to work fast. Um, it is no longer a luxury. So uh, I also worked on a movie called Army of Frankenstein. I mean, look how rough this stuff is. But when I was working with the art director, this is all he wanted to see. He's like, I just want to see raw, rough, crazy, weird crap. And um, what he liked about it is that he could interpret the shapes the way he wanted to. Now, mind you, that was a limited experience. Uh, most studios would not allow this type of direction to fly. And this is once again, pre-3D, pre-rendered all the stuff. The, there was a moment in time where concept design was this. It was about the, the loose iteration. It was about the loose idea of, of um, you know, thought. It, so um, that, that's the only cautionary tale I have about 3D and uh, the way industry has moved is that it's moved away from this, when I'm pointing at this, you know, all, all these thumbnails and iterations, and it's gone down to this, which is the final rendered image. And if we spend all our time figuring out how to make something a final render, but we overlook the foundations of what the design is, no matter how pretty a design, how pretty the final image is, it's still, I'm gonna call it chocolate covered crap. Mmm, <laughs> chocolate, I love it. You eat it like, oh my God, that's awful, it's poop. So, um, you know, so really, uh, at least that's been my emphasis in terms of how I see the industry changing. I don't see much emphasis happening um, in design. Now, mind you, feature animation, just the opposite. It's all about the design. That's why you know, pre-production for, for feature animation really goes to the grassroots and they really embellish and really, really embrace this. Um, and again, there, there is a return to going back to the grassroots of this loose iteration. It's starting to happen, uh, but um, in feature film, um, what, what I'm pointing over here doesn't really, doesn't really exist anymore. They just want to see some hyperly finished and realized. So that's where it comes down to Again, portfolio, your outlook. Where do you see yourself fitting into the industry? How do you want to work? And what studios offers those type of ways of working? So um, that's where, again, having that definitive direction will help allow you to navigate and um, you know define your portfolio, but also define your. Isn't that disgusting? Uh, <laughs> Some melting zombie. Oh, so gross. Uh, it was supposed to, this was also, uh, I was working on a number of different movie pitches. So um, I do get courted from time to time to work with uh, movie directors where they'll have anywhere from two to four scripts and I'll do their, their pitch art. I'll do the key art and they'll pitch the artwork along with the script to get funding for the project, to get greenlit. And if it gets greenlit, then I get brought on to the project. Majority of the times, I would say, if you don't know this about the film industry, uh, movie directors on average will pitch from five to 10 different movie projects. And if they're lucky, they might get one that gets picked up. A lot of times um, movie studios are picking directors to do something specific for them. So uh, back in the day, it was more of a, let's say, what's going to use John Carpenter. He's like, I'm going to create the thing. I had this idea and he would pitch it in the studio because, you know, he has credentials. He's like, yeah, we can bank on you. We know we can, we can make money from what you're going to do. Go for it. Uh, the movie industry has changed dramatically um, in, in, in that way. But you have Netflix now, and Netflix is going back to the grassroots where people are pitching ideas, and that's why there's a lot of cool things happening on Netflix. Not, I don't work for them, by the way, but um, there's, there's, there's a lot of original content happening. It's a creature design for uh, Hellgate London. That was a fun game as well. Okay, Jason, I have 
a question, and then I probably suggest to you should suggest to you we have an hour and like fifteen minutes left. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, we can jump into doing a, a quick demo. Uh huh. Right. So, uh, do you have any tips for making art look scary or disturbing? Do I have any tips for making the artwork look scary? Is that right? Yeah, look scary or disturbing. Okay, so that is really comes down to you. What do you find scary and disturbing? I mean, that, so that that's that's really I I wish. I mean, I can tell you what I find scary and disturbing, but for other people, it could be a meh, whatever, boring. So, I think that that's that's the voice that we get to have as as artists and designers. You really have to channel that. And so, and if you don't know what it is, then this is a moment where you could actually maybe get to learn a bit more about yourself. What what are your phobias? Are you afraid of scared uh, of spiders? Are you scared of you have a phobia of snakes? Find a phobia, um, and and then channel what that is, and try to understand why you react. What, what is it that makes you fundamentally disturbed and freaked out by whatever phobia that is? If you don't have a phobia, then the other thing to do is look at very popular phobias. Do your research, research about psychology, research about um, again the the I mean the go to phobia for a lot of people. Is arachnids, arachnophobia, huge, massive. Why? Try to understand what, what makes arachnophobia terrifying. And then look at the aspects of it. it sometimes it could be color. Sometimes it could be, um, you know, the multiple legs, the way it moves, its body position. Um, the fact that, like a lot of people, when they, they see a spider, especially bigger ones, they're, they're, uh, the way they're crouched and the way that the legs form, it becomes, it's um, very disgusting looking. It sounds really weird. Uh, and again, and, and they're very hairy, like everything about it, they're, they're a very fascinating creature. So I no longer find them disgusting. Um, and I did have arachnophobia for a period of time. So that's the reason why I'm using arachnophobia. So, uh, but with, with arachnids, I mean, we really can't see their eyes, can we? And um, they, they do have eyes, of course they can see, it's great. But for the most part, there, there's there is this, this um, yeah, it's not human form, it's an insectoid. So anyways, so that, that's the type of things I respond to. And that's the type of things that I add to to my designs. So if, if I'm going to create, um, you know, once again, if I'm doing a character, but let's say I, if I have to mutate the character, what makes it disturbing? Make them really hairy. I'm not sure if you saw a really hairy person their whole body hairy. <laughs> I actually had a roommate who was, I, I think he was a part Neanderthal. I think he came from the, the Ice Age. I mean, he took off his shirt and he was still wearing a shirt. He, he had a sweater on. It was like, oh God. You know, I could like throw like Velcro brawls on, on his chest and it would stick. Um, but yeah, I was like, holy God, it's so crazy. You're a hairy dude. So again, so, so this is channeling these sort of looks. And again, being aware of what stimulates the brain to have to have a reaction. So hopefully that, that helps out, if that makes sense. Yes. All right, well, let me uh, switch on over to Photoshop. And... All right, so I present to you, uh, by the way, uh, sketching. Uh, so everybody that's coming here, um, does everybody have a background um, does everybody draw on a regular basis, or is everybody coming from a more of a 3D skill set? No, I'm just kind of curious. And that's my cat. Yes. All right. So the, the reason why I'm, I'm prompting this question is because I believe in duality of not only sketching every day. Um, let me just go back to one last folder so you can see the, the sketches that, that I, I normally do. Uh, I have I have over 500 pages. So this is one page. I have over 500 pages plus uh, of of these you know doodles and iterations and sketches, whatever else. And I spend anywhere from you know this would be a five minute drawing. This would be you know 10 15 minutes. The things I usually plug in about half an hour, and I can usually get a full page done. 
you can see that I'm not really getting lost into the nuance of really refinement. I'm just playing with shapes. You, you can get into the, the aspect of design, uh, you know, later on. But uh, so I find that drawing every day keeps my hand moving in a different way. And also draw with a pen because you can't undo. So when you draw it, you just got to leave it. That's done. You know, there's no, hmm, I'm going to erase this and start over again. No, just let it be. So it's, it's a different way of allowing your brain to exercise and draw. And it's also a flexing what you have internally in terms of your thoughts, what you know, and what you don't know. And I find if I don't know how to draw something, then guess what? I'll spend the next day, um, let's say if my anatomy on a horse is off, I'll be just drawing and studying horses because I'm trying to train my brain to remember the anatomy, the structure of what makes a horse a horse or an arm an arm, if that makes sense. So, um, so there, there's that aspect that I, I find and I really advocate is very important to be grounded traditionally. And then to use digital tools to accentuate, to push and pull it further. And um, again, there, there's different ways of working and um, I found digital tools can actually strengthen my, my original design and that can actually go further beyond uh, what I'm doing. So I'm not going to be stuck in this one zone. I can use it as a directional point. If that makes sense. Most people responded in the chat that they draw two dimensionally um, and draw. I guess that's, that's what they're saying. Right on. Perfect. Good. Hey, Jason, I am going to run out of the room for about a minute and I'll be yep. right back. So, um, if you ask a question and I'm not there, uh, I'll be right back. All right. All right, guys. So, uh, this is uh, something I just, you know, scanned out of my sketchbook. I'm just going to show you a little bit of a work process uh, right now today. We're not going to get into a final illustration just because we're, we got about an hour. So, I'm going to get as far as I can in terms of showing to you, uh, utilizing your sketch and bring it up into a, a point of presentation. Something where you can actually show that the shapes are refined and um, you can show it to your art director and he could go, oh, cool, I get this. I understand this. So not only we're gonna um, refine uh, the sketch itself, we're also gonna dip into um, doing some iterations on what the design is. So quick, fast iterations. And then um, also do a quick color pass in terms of you know just getting the idea of the feeling of what the, the creature is in terms of the color palette. So they would call it a color study. And uh, I've tried this year. Right on. So I'll be trying to, while John is out, uh, I'll be aware of the chats. So I'll, I'll try to, you can see right here, I'll try to keep aware of you. So if I, if I get a ping, I'll, I'll, I'll check in and see. So um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, number one, I work multiple layers. So it's the way I enjoy working. Um, it might get a little crazy, but let's go ahead and begin. So, and also I like to get into labeling all my stuff. So I'm gonna call this base. I'm gonna duplicate it because I like to work in a very possibly non-destructive fashion. So in other words, if I screw up this drawing right now, and like, you know, just right now I'm just gonna crap all over it, right? Awful. You know, I can go ahead and just wipe that out. Cool. Um, but I like to work on top of the actual drawing itself. You know, a lot of times you can create a layer, you know, move it around, whatever else, destroy it. But for this case in point, for this demonstration, I'm going to show you something cool. So what I like to do now, is like, I'm not sure you guys have really uh, played around too much with the smudge tool, uh, especially with these drawings. Um, once again, I'm, I've been using pen, so I found this has been really cool. So I get the smudge tool. I have it on 100%. And um, I have a skid ton of brushes that I use. For this case in point and example, I'm going to be focusing predominantly on one brush. It's essentially a round tool, but it has a little bit of um, noise to it. So, um, so that's going to be the main brush I'm going to be using. So, um, and so essentially, I'm just going to go here and just start smudging away. And what this is going to do is going to allow me to quickly build up a sense of volume. So we're no longer just looking at lines. So the, the emphasis is going to be to get rid of the noise and get a sense of volume. 
And you'd be surprised how quickly, and again, uh, with, with these loose drawings the way they are, by doing this, it, um, it's pretty cool how quickly it can change. Again, defining volume, defining shape, and um, what do you want to call it? Form. That's the word, form. And I'm pretty sure you can see that I'm not going to be overly precious about like, oh shit, you know, am I going to mess something up? This is the moment not to really worry. So, so in that way, it's a, it's a very destructive way of working, but you also might be able to actually run across certain forms that um, you wouldn't discover otherwise. So, uh, so has anybody really been uh, using the uh, smudge tool by chance or familiar with it uh, because the reason why I'm asking is that uh, there's an artist named uh, Crypt Crawler. So Brad Wrigley is that if that name sounds familiar, great, then you know what I'm talking about. If you don't know, you gotta look this dude up. Brad Wrigley. 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 There we Rigley. go. Yeah. You appeared out of nowhere. Where'd you go? All right, so uh, I'm back. Yes, yeah, so you're back. Uh, so um, yeah, so so definitely the smudge tool can get it muddy. And the things that I, you can see how I'm using it right now, the intent is that I'm not really worrying about. Um, usually, muddy happens when um, you're when you're using more color. At least for me, if I'm using the smudge tool, it can it can muddy the the color for sure. So if you're focusing on black and white, all your working with then, I'm pretty sure you can see, is just value, right? So you're no longer really um, concerned about, um, yeah, form is the only thing we're clearly worrying about this moment in time. Or focusing on, not worrying, focusing, that's the better word, yes. And um, again, if, if you get a chance to try this, there's, there's a little, see this little accidental nuance that's in there? It gives it a very organic feel. So again, this is working really good with uh, creature design. So, so this, this is, um, once again, it's, it's a playful way of not worrying about how you're gonna be rendering the form. It's allowing the forms to kind of start to show themselves a bit. I mean, we were already, if you've done the drawing, you've done the homework in terms of defining the direction of where you're going, in terms of the form. Um, you know, you do find the form with line. So, so now we're starting to define the form with with value, and no longer line. So, and uh, again, I found, for me, uh, I this is pretty much how I work, especially when I'm doing stuff for for magic, especially when it comes to doing uh, creature cards, and whatnot. Because um, to me, there's there's a playful moment that that happens and um it's, it's easy to get uh, i would say frustrated and sometimes in uh working uh, I, I think every piece has its moments of enjoyment and then frustration and so this is my moment of, of enjoyment because i'm not overly too once again locked in and precious about exactly how the forms are coming together i'm just trying to get something formulated in the right direction. Yeah. So, and in general, I'd still use uh, when I'm actually working on a piece. Uh, I still use a smudge tool uh, when it comes into production, but I use it very lightly. I don't use it as aggressive as as you see right now. Um, a lot of times I'll be blocking in some uh, some light. If I block in, let's say, for example, if I'm working on clouds and, um, you know, I, I use a brush and, and it's very noisy. Let's say I see, a lot, I see a lot of brush strokes, but it's not the, like, oh, cool, that's a nice brush stroke. It's like, oh, shit, it's really noisy brush stroke. Um, that's where the smudge tool is perfect because it just softens uh, the edges. Again, uh, I mentioned Brad uh, simply because uh, he's the first person who actively said, by the way, I use a smudge tool. It's great. I'm like, what? I'm like, that's, it, it just blew my mind 
And then when I saw him actually working and, you know, smudging and, um, oh, wow, you know, that's actually a pretty smart idea. Yeah, my cat agrees. <laughs> mm. So by the way, I am a cat owner and um, so he's my co-pilot in my studio. His name is Chucho. He's the dude. It's literally Chucho is Spanish for the dude. So he, he is the dude. So, so as you can see, it's um, you know, this is a, a very sort of, you know, building the form and shape and value. So the key word is is the value and form. So, it's it can be a little lackluster, right? Not super exciting to watch, but but how quickly? Um, so let's check it out. And I guarantee you for, for me to go through, so for example, if I were to create a new layer and let's say I'm gonna put them on multiply. You know, start to build up form. Because a lot of times I'll use multiply to actually get a, a darker value in and then I'll start going in there and start to paint it up. You kind of see that you can immediately start getting into the whole intricacies of really locking yourself into knowing the shape and the volume. Not necessarily a bad way of working, as found by doing what I'm doing here. It's a quick iteration. Like, boom, damn, there it goes. Uh, when I say damn, it's like it's almost done in terms of really feeling, oh, these forms are actually turning. They're actually doing something. So, um, and again, there, there's, it's not getting locked into um, I'll put this way, I'm trying to do my best not to, at this moment in time, get locked into detail, right? Uh, not to get locked into the form. Okay, we've gotten into some um, highly technical questions. Yeah. Uh, first one, what breed is your cat? <laughs> Uh, it is a short-haired American cat, uh, but also known as a tabby. And he sounds adorable. <laughs> yeah. Second, the second one, um, not more of a statement, but I guess a, a request. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to be slightly disappointed if you don't show us a picture of your cat. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. <I> would, <laughs> yeah. No, it's a. It's a. It's a good request. Like, normally, you know, as with like any parent, normally they have a like Rolodex of photos ready to go. Um, I have them all over my phone. But, uh, well, if, if we get time, I'll see, see if I get something on my hard drive. Yeah, he's, um, he, he keeps me occupied, to say the least. So, and, and also share with you, I know we're, we're a little gridlocked on time here. And so uh, the only reason I'm saying that is that I did have uh, this sped up just a little bit. You know, I did some uh, some earlier uh, exploring on this so um, so so because there's a lot of things I wanted to cover that are pretty useful um, but uh, there's one extra thing I want to show you so I'm gonna create a new layer yes a new layer and uh, and I find there is this powerful strange way of working to also define shape as well so I am putting an emboss bevel on top of this guy so yes of course and I'm just gonna choose a neutral gray. So around 50, 47%. Pretty select. So, um, and let me get my opacity 100%. All right, so check this out. I'm gonna turn off this bottom layer just so we can actually see what I'm doing. Um, let me also, I'm just gonna put a white box underneath so we can actually see what's happening. So I'm going to lower the transparency so you can see a little clearer about what's happening on this layer where I have the, embezzle, the bevel embossed. I'm not sure if anybody has seen this or tried this or done this, but um, if you haven't, it's going to be pretty interesting. So right now, you're like, oh, okay, where's this going? I'm only going to get a couple of tentacles in here. And then I'll show you the power of 
what this can do on a very quick basis. And again, I found anytime I have to do something that has multiple forms, so especially uh, rounded forms. So rounded forms is the key right now I'm using uh, to, to talk to you about this because you'll see in a moment. So, all right, cool. So we're getting a couple of things happening here. All right, so we're gonna go back into Bevel and Boss, open up this feature, and we're going to size it up. Immediately we got a round form. Isn't that cool? So uh, you can soft end up if you don't want too much of a hard edge. But the other aspect that makes this kind of fascinating is that we can choose the light angle. So the, the closer you get to the middle, the more of a, you know, almost like a specular highlight we're getting. And the further away you get from the circle, the, the softer it gets. Again, I, I think this is a, a potentially very useful way of, of um, again, rounded forms. This works very, very well, so as you can see. So I'm gonna go ahead and click OK on that. So let me get back to where we were. So that's on top, right? And then if I want to, I could actually change this to, you know, multiply or, or even better, I could actually just darken those. So let me go ahead, I'm gonna create a new layer. Has anybody worked with clipping masks? And uh, so what this is, clipping mask, that only affects the layer that's down below it. So right now, I'm just going to, this is just a new layer. I'm just going to grab just a big brush. So where's my big brush? Right here, my airbrush. And we have, we have several that said they have worked with it before. Oh, okay. So with clipping mask, good. It's a very, very powerful tool. So right now, uh, because the clipping mask is only affecting the tentacles that we created. So I'm just pretty much just now going ahead, you know, knocking those back, you know, adding some extra dimension to this. All right, so, so that's a couple of different ways of approaching getting quick iterations in terms of, you know, the form. So, so just a recap, so I'm gonna go ahead and just get rid of these guys here and get back down to the basis. So back to the root, as I would say. So, but as you can say, once again, we, we have a sense of uh, volume that's happening. It's great, awesome, it's quick iteration. So what I do next, and I'm gonna go ahead and get my earlier file that I had set up. Mm -hmm. Let me go ahead and open that. So I'll go here, details. So name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, I think I just opened the same file. That's fantastic. All right, so let's do this. Great, okay. So that is the different one I want to do. All right, so let me open the other file. But anyways, so we're gonna get back on track and, okay. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Okay, sorry, all over the place here. This is the one I'm looking for. This is the person I'm trying to find. Okay, cool. So remember, so I essentially got to the point where we are now, right? So I went ahead and smudged this to the next level, right? So everything is no longer a line. We have now just mass, right? We have just value and forms happening. So we want to get back into actually defining what these masses are now. So we want to get back down to cool. Let's, let's find out exactly how the breastplate works. What are those details? What is happening with this dude? So I'm gonna close that out. So this is where um, what's gonna get down to the naming convention. So I created a new group and I called them lines. So pretty simple. And that's where I literally just started 
and I'll just jump in here real quick so you can see. Let's get a simple round brush or whatever brush you like to sketch with. And um, start to actually redefine the shape of what this creature is. So uh, I find, uh, again, this, this process, since there's something underneath it, it, it does open itself to interpretation. Um, so if we don't like the, you know, if you don't like a certain look and direction of something, it's, there's nothing saying you can't evolve this, or you can't change the shape, other than what you feel is right and what, 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 is, what is the shape that are working, because there, there may be something you're doing, and then I'll see it, oh cool, I love this shape, and you just keep with it. So again, I, I'm finding in this process, there, there is a sense of discovery by, by going actually through this. And again, this is the, the, way, the way I've been working for a period of time. And uh, if I want to get to the point where this creature needs to be photoreal, so it has to have a very tangible look, then I would go ahead and define the character. And then from there, mm hmm, interesting. All right, pain pressure, yes. Much better. Okay, and um, anyways, so if it gets to the point where a client is like, we need to see a photo reel, you know, creature that you, you're creating, um, I still would draw it out and then I would use my initial design as, as a springboard into 3D. And I actually just discovered that actually having the, the transfer, having that turned off and having it where it's a very direct line, it reminds me of just straight pen tool. And um, I find if you need to keep a hard edge this is actually a better way of working. So, so uh, another thing that, um, again, to embrace the fact that we're digital, I'm pretty sure you guys do this already. Smudge tool, um, not only that, but also uh, the warp tool is fantastic. The uh, liquify is great. So I'm going to be a little bit more conscious about the shape because I'm pretty sure you know that if you like a shape, eh, just select it. And uh, I'm, I'm positive you know as well that if you want to create a brush um, that has this pattern, you know, you could easily do it. So. That's um. Yeah, so it says like it's sort of ribbed sort of thing on his front chest, right? So let me go ahead and pull that aside. I'm assuming everybody here has experience doing custom brushes, and understands the the power of what it can be. So. Let me go ahead and duplicate that. Flip it. Deselect. All right, so they get that on its own. So, all right. But um, so I'll just do a, a quick brush define, right? Define brush bone. All right. Deselect. All right, so let me go ahead and I'm just going to delete that for now. Deselect. And there it is. And um, again, for sure everybody's aware of this. It's got to change the space in us. And clearly I had the white and the black selected. So unfortunately I got some of the background on it. So it's not a clean selection. So that's the reason why this is happening. 
Yeah. You can get that fixed. Anyways, so when you make your own brushes, pretty sure you know. And uh, let me uh, go ahead and, and so let me go back and get that when I was defining the brush. By the way, always have your your histories here. Um, if you can set up to have a a ton of history in terms of you know like twenty five thirty, uh, I definitely recommend it. It's it's insanely useful. So let me go ahead and just get the line. There we go. So you can see the line's only selected, right? Cool. So again, let's go define the brush. Bone two. Deselect. All right, so let me get this out of here. New layer. Cool. So. Change the angle. Uh, I can also that. So yeah, you can you can tell you can bend it, warp it, whatever else. Again, I'm pretty sure you guys are, and everybody is aware of this, but I'm doing this just in case. Um, if you haven't seen this, let me scroll out. And also, shape dynamics, rotation. So, anyways, you can you can get it where it follows your direction. And um, it can be pretty useful. Uh, right now, uh, I just wanted to make sure that you're, you're aware of this. I tend to use these patterns when I'm actually going in and actually texturing a bit of actual, there's a tentacles themselves. So let me go ahead and get rid of that here because you could always put a mask on this. Another thing that I love to use are masks on a layer. Holy crap, the best. See how many, uh, by the way, I, I fell into the, the pitfall of downloading too many brushes. So uh, I found over the years that there's everybody, and, and uh, again, I'm gonna say the word grandma, uh, has posted their brushes they can use. I find that um, if, if you can really spend some time in defining your own brushes, but you utilize in some that, are, that can be helpful, it's great, but otherwise, um, a lot of these brushes are made by artists specifically for a project. And when they're done with uh, the project, they're done with the brushes. And so, um, so essentially, I only use about five brushes. So the majority of the stuff, no clue. I downloaded it, tried it, you know, kind of spun my wheels. So how are we doing on time here? Okay, so we got uh, about 40 minutes. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. So anyway, so let me go ahead and get rid of some of this stuff. So I'm gonna delete the layer mask. So I'm gonna go ahead and just pose that off. I wanna put this in its own separate layer. So, so now it's up here, right? Cool. So I'll go back to here. So, um, but I just want to definitely show you that how we're right here in the chest plate, just having that one shape and replicating it was very, very useful, right? It created that really cool pattern. I didn't have to redraw it. And it just looks like I just pounded out a, a ton of detail um, when it actually literally, literally, besides defining the initial shape, um, everything else was was pretty quick, right? Uh, so that's, um, again, that's the useful aspect. So anybody in, in class familiar with Magic the Gathering? Anybody have aspirations to either play the game or um, it's, it's, it's a big, big landscape uh, when I say Magic. It's, um, it's been, what, 25 years now? Or, or actually, does anybody play it? No responder in this. <laughs> uh, Yes, um, I have uh, so many cards. It's embarrassing. Ah. I didn't. Do, uh, I've been been playing for years. Um, 
avid player. Yeah, but quite a few. Yeah. Good. Well, the, the, the reason why I, I'm, I'm curious now is that over the years, uh, there's been so many artists now being hired by Magic. When I say that, Wizard of the Coast specifically. And a lot of the artists that they're hiring are, are people who are, are very avid players. And so, and Magic, in my opinion, in terms of the art directors these days, all the people who actually work there, they play the game. They, they know the game. They understand not only it's, is it, uh, I find it's, it's been insightful to know, to know this uh, and to share with you is that because as with, uh, let's say, Blizzard Entertainment, I'm going to name drop that company right now. The reason why it's important to mention them is that they love to hire people that not only are aware of the properties, but play their properties. They want people who are fans of what the game is, what they do. Uh, because uh, there is, again, so, uh, I think the big part of the reason why it's important to mention that is that um, all the new magic artists that have been hired, again, they're, they're avid fans, and um, the client, in terms of the art director, can say, hey, by the way, this is not black mana aligned, or this is not a green creature, but it's a black creature or a blue creature, and they can start using game terminology, and the artist itself, themselves, will know and understand exactly what the art director is talking about. So it's understanding terminology, it's understanding what the product is, and understanding uh, what is needed from the artist when it comes to very specific game mechanics, but also the lingo of, of what the game's about. So uh, again, that's that's been a big turn of events uh, over the years. I've noticed um, that there's been more people being hired um, that, that know the product and play the product. And, and trust me, when I've done some uh, events in the past, specifically around Magic the Gathering, I found that <clears throat> I would say the, the players, the fan base, when they walk up and they meet me, they're like, cool, man, hey, man, I love your work, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, yeah, great, thanks, dude. And then they'll, they'll ask me, so, uh, do you play Magic? And when I tell them I don't, can I tell you how many sad faces I get? How many like, oh, what? You don't play Magic? <laughs> uh, that's it. It's, so I've learned how to play Magic over the years. But uh, I, I was really taken back by how the fan base themselves um, were, were affected by the fact that um, when an artist actually plays Magic, the fan base has more of a, of a personal connection with that artist. So, and um, so when I, when I would tell people I don't play magic, I, I could literally tell like, oh, you, you don't get me. You don't understand me. Because they, they would love to talk about, you know, how they play a certain card or the play set or whatever. They'll start to tell me about like, oh man, I just milled this dude. And to me, it's, just, it's like a programmer talking about how he just programmed, you know, an AI computer to do something. I'd be like, I have no idea what just happened um, or what the person said. So again, lingo savvy, understanding your market, knowing the products, and within that, knowing the property. It's, it's um, that there is some truth and validity, and um, some bonuses that come with it for actually being a legitimate, you know, enjoying the actual product itself. Again, I mean, I started out playing uh, Dungeons and Dragons. And then I played tons of um, RPGs when I say that in role-playing games. So um, <clears throat> Pool of Radiance and Wasteland and Bard's Tale and anything that was fancy, man. I was just all over it. Just could not get enough. All right, so, so you can see how it just, it, it's methodically going through, trying not to get into rendering, but so by the way, so what's happening here in terms of these lines i'm looking at that as a, as like muscle fiber so it's like strands of muscle so that's why the iterations are happening there and so so th those are, that's information that i need to have because it's useful when it comes down to actually um you know solidifying the actual design but as i can tell with like bigger shapes here so you know unless unless it's really helped defining how the, the form is turning, um, I'm trying not to get into overly 
being textured. You know what I mean? Like for example, when I just dotted up here, you know, that, uh, that'd be essentially almost like pores or something like that. That'd be too much detail right now. So I try to break these up into bite-sized pieces that where every step is, at least for me, uh, a bit of enjoyment because I'm actually still designing and I can still iterate if I want uh, on where things are going. The part I find is the most taxing is actually is the uh, the tentacles, just because like after a while, oh my god, you know, it's just you draw a skid ton of tentacles. It, it can be a bit overwhelming. They're fun for a little bit, but flip your canvas. I'm pretty sure you've heard this sage advice. Still holds true. Um, it's it's pretty amazing how just flipping and rotating the the canvas can alter your perception about not only what have you drawn but how the shapes are coming together. And either the shapes are going to look great, and it's exactly what you wanted, or you can go, oh my goodness, this is completely screwy. For example, like right here, that's just not working. So, yeah. So this is where uh, I'm gonna use the word, this can go into the, the dead space. When I say that, you know, it's just then, it's almost, this is the meditative space uh, to be in. Because once again, you have the form here, but you know, what exactly how is this form coming together? So you start to think a little bit more logically about bone mass, anatomy, um, you know, that's the, Bone right here that's coming out. Jason, I'm going to bring this up yep. and just talk to you. This may seem odd to you, but the similarity in how I draw the figure and how I teach, or how the Illustration Academy teaches figure drawing, mm -hmm. this is incredibly similar. Um, we block in a flat shape, a silhouette, and then start, you know, think about detail at the end put light hitting form, going back and refining with line. And it's an incredibly similar thing. Obviously, we don't have the command Z and you're just kind of reacting with, to what you put down. But um, this is, I relate to this really, really well. Right on, man. Very cool to see. So, um, thanks for ch uh, chiming in saying so. I mean, that's, that's really good to hear. That means that I'm on the right path then, you know? I think, um, you, regardless of, um, I think we talked about this earlier, John, um, in terms of, <clears throat> I would say, illustration versus concept design, there are, the paths can be so similar, um, ridiculously similar. Um, I, I think the, the deviation in illustration, from my opinion, is that there, there's the ability to have a larger voice, and more of a distinct voice in illustration think uh, concept design um, is, is a little more limited in that space. But besides that, I think the skill set is insanely applicable. Yeah, and then, you know, the, the people I look at, you know, as concept designers, I mean, you know, I, I look at uh, the ones that maybe are a little bit more personal, but man, they're just great drawers and painters. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, you know, when I first saw uh, Koro's work, and what his capabilities were, it just, it blew me away. That guy's a seriously good artist. Yeah. And yeah. Um, same is true with like Vance Kovacs, um, Justin Sweet, um, people, people uh, obviously Carla and Wes. Um, uh, you brought up Ian McKay. I mean, they're, they're man, they, they got some really serious drawing and painting chops. And it, uh, just the best of it is, you know, the part I take from it is just really good drawing and painting. Yep. That's, I mean, that's literally the, uh, I'm, once again, I, I subscribe to exactly what you're talking about, John. And, uh, and I, I totally agree. I, honestly, that, that was 
the the crazy part I remember first time so we mentioned about Coro and and you know and so, some of the crew from Massa Black. So I remember going to the first workshop, and uh, I'm not going to get into details about about the workshop. Oh, then I remember I was working at a studio, you know, being paid, and um, you know, and feeling I would say confident, you know, like cool man, I got a job, people like me, you know, I got skills, blah blah blah. And then um, when I went to the Massive Black workshop, my roommate at the time was was Wes. So you know, it's the first time meeting him. He was just getting out of school. He just finished, right? And um, and of course, I'm I'm a curious little beaver. So I'm like, hey, dude, yeah, I heard you just finished school, and um, you know, Coral said a lot of amazing things about your work. You know, can I see your portfolio? He's like, and at the time, uh, so I'm not sure if everybody has met Wes. He's he's become a lot more spoken. And when I first met him, he was very soft spoken. He was very, I would say, reserved. Is probably a good word. Yeah, and he, that's, he was when I met him. I met him in 2009, and he was okay. really, really quiet. All right, so, so you understand what I'm talking about. And so um, I'm like, that's cool. And he's like, all right. And at the time, he had this comb over. He had a very nice emo haircut. And he um, kept on combing it over. He's like, yeah, whatever, dude. And uh, I looked at his portfolio, his graduating portfolio, and I was godsmacked. I, I literally was just kicked in the teeth, you know, because his draftsmanship, his ability to draw and to fabricate uh, with with graphite and a sheet of paper was just mind blowing. I just it blew me away. I'm like I, I felt confident I could draw, but what he made me realize was um, is that I, I was working in a very narrow um, with horse blinds. I was very focused on production. I was very focused on what I needed to do for my job, and that's not necessarily a bad space to be in, but what that job does is that we're not allowed to excel in terms of our skill set per se traditionally and fundamentally i mean if if you don't know perspective you can jump into 3d and overlook perspective and never really uh hammer on your your traditional skill set you can bypass <clears throat> you know the foundations um if, if you're proficient in making things look beautiful 3d wise and um so, you know, I just fell into that bracket. And um, so when I, oh, I met Wes, I went, oh my God, my, my 2D skill set has atrophied so much. Like I had let that slip so far. And, um, and the reason why I thought it was important is that because I got, I got good at using 3D as, as a way of getting things done, uh, but I felt uh, there was more to learn. And uh, so, when I, so when I met him, I'm like, holy crap, dude, yeah. I'm like, wow. I really need to put in my time with my foundations. And I found as soon as I did that, my skill set, my production, and everything I was doing jumped dramatically. Huge jump. I'll tell you uh, a secret about Wes, <laughs> which, as I said, we both said, he was very quiet and reserved. <clears throat> it was probably the third time I was around him that he kind of, before he really even spoke to me in any uh, any length, and he said, hey, um, just a heads up, you know, I'm from Kansas City, and I didn't know that. I'd been around him three times, and he said, yeah, I'm from the same town you're from, or that you live in, and then then realized at one point, I, I remember meeting his father years and years ago. His father's name is Dudley, and um, his dad's a designer, and when Wes came in the first time he came and did the academy with us and taught for a week, he asked, he requested, he goes, hey, can we go eat lunch at the museum and then maybe hang out at the museum for like an hour or two? And it embarrassed me when we were at the museum that he hasn't lived in Kansas City for 10 years or 12 years. And he knew the museum a hundred times better than I did. And it, it became really apparent to me. It all kind of came together. He lived in this place for a very long time as a child. <laughs> he spent a huge amount of time there. And it was his, it was his focus. Um, and I, I don't know how many of you in, because Wes was a speaker for us last semester. So I, I don't know how many of you that are in this within our, in our classes have, have 
had Wesley as a, 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 pr a presenter in our program. But, uh, and he will contribute again. Hopefully he'll be one of the contributors in, in your class, Wes. I mean, uh, Wes will be one of the contributors in your class, Jason. Um, yes. I think it would be pretty, pretty easy to convince him to do it. <clears throat> but he's, a, he's amazing to watch just because that he's an anomaly with his, his draftsmanship. Yeah. Yeah, he's, uh, plus what, um, he's, uh, plus what I found <clears throat> that I've met people over the years when, when they're born to do something, it's obvious, you know? And, uh, and so it made me learn that th there's, everybody has certain limitations, everybody has a certain direction to goal. And um, it's, I found every path is so distinctly different. Even to say, my goal was, I would love to draw like Wes. I like to have the proficiency of draftsmanship, whatever else. So once again, we're just using Wes as an example. Um, <clears throat> that'd be amazing, but guess what? Um, he's Wes and that's what he does. And I think um, we can have our general direction where we want to go, but as we're actually in it and learning and producing and creating, um, something emerges that sometimes you may not expect. And sometimes it's a beautiful discovery, sometimes. So by the way, so I created a, a bunch of lines. What I did is I just now uh, went ahead and uh, I'm gonna clean up the, uh, the actual underneath. So when I say underneath, so let me go ahead and take away this white sheet. So we went ahead and did the, uh, the line work, but you notice that we got a lot of gray lines everywhere here and there. And so it makes it kind of murky, kind of muddy. And so that's where I just created a selection set. So I hit it, but now it's available. So the reason why I, the defining the lines and putting the white box is that we can do a selection set. So we create a permanent selection um, that we can use to call upon at any time that we need it, if that makes sense. So I'll, I'll show you for example. So I'm going to copy and paste. So I'm going to copy and paste up here. So let me turn everything off. So now it's, you see the main character right now, the main creature. So it's, that that's a selection set. I'm going to use that anytime I need to block out something. So it will make sense in the moment. So anyways, that, this is our, our original lines. So let me go ahead and turn off the lines. So I'm gonna go back down to the base. <clears throat> I'm gonna create a new layer, right? So now I'm gonna, if you hold the Alt, I mean the Control button, and you see that change to Control, and I'm gonna click on the actual icon of that layer, is it actually grabs that selection. I'm going to invert the selection. <clears throat> and then now in that new layer, I just put above the smudge. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get my favorite little brush right here. I'm just going to go ahead and just, oh, geez, what's going on? So let me hide the lines. Let me put, cool. All right. So now I've got the lines back up. So I'm just going to go ahead and just blow out and hit those, hit the edge. So we get a really clean, clean edge. Right on. So put this back up because I found there's another area I want to add. Okay. So here. So hopefully this is making a little bit of sense. Uh, all I did was to create a selection set so I can go ahead and just isolate and just hit his uh, silhouette to clarify and clean up his silhouette. Which we got. Cool beans. So uh, let's see here. What are we doing on? I just want to check and see. All right. So 2.40. Uh, well, 2.40 my time. So it's what? 4.40 you guys? You guys time? So I'm going to show you something really kind of strange. And, and um, I like to, so remember I talked about presentation, got a character design, creature design, create some sort of backdrop. You kind of see that I already have instilled. So let me go ahead and get rid of the lines. You know, I got these sort of triangles, whatever else. And it's a sky floating, fantastic, great. So I put that all back up. So I'm gonna go ahead and 
now we're gonna, I'm actually going to add some uh, some color. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So this is where I'm going to go ahead and grab. Remember that selection set I had? And uh, cool. So I just realized I need to. Oops, sorry, I'm going to deselect. I'm going to hose that off here. Boom. Cool. All right, so we've got a clean selection. So I'm going to duplicate this layer. Once again, I'm going to call it selection only, right? So this is the only reason why we have this layer is to use it for selection. So I'm going to turn it off so we can ignore it. And so now, once again, I'm going to create a new folder. I'm just going to call it colors. Colors. So on the actual layer itself, I'm going to go to the, uh, if everybody does or does not know, FX stands for effects. And I'm going to use gradient overlay. And that's going to lay over right now on, on the creature. And so, uh, and you can change the type of modes we have here. And this can actually kind of can pound out some, some base color to work with. So right now I'm just toggling right, right here, the blend mode. I'm just going through just to see how the color is like laying over on top of the figure. So I'm just going to leave it here for now. Now, I also discovered, and this is a quite, quite nutty. <laughs> You'll see in a moment. So let me turn this off. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to, so once again, got to call the palette right here. So stay with me. So I'm going to create a layer behind the character, right? So I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste all. So essentially it's the whole entire, um, once again, it's the whole entire scene. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to add a gradient layer to this. And again, and part of uh, when I'm using gradients, I'm actually, I just like to, in a moment, um, at any time, I'm pretty sure you know this, you can click on here, you can choose if you want a different color. So, so anytime you can choose that. I'm gonna cancel all that. Uh, but what I'm gonna show you is that there's this really amazing sort of strange thing that happens. Because I wanted a blue sky, right? Um, so I thought this is actually a perfect perfect gradient. Yeah, you know, the sky is starting to set. It's like dusk, getting close to dusk. So some kind of cool. So uh, on top of that, we have now the character. So. Once again, because the character, the creature, has been isolated. Uh, <clears throat> and at any time, you can uh, this, you can turn off the effect if you don't want it. Or if you wanted to dither down the effect, you can create a mask and you can go ahead and actually start to get rid of what's underneath. on top of it so no it's uh, this this is a little bit more getting into the uh, sort of advanced way of, of working but uh, I found that I call this non-destructive way of working the reason why I call it non-destructive is because if I want to do uh, color iterations on this so I'm gonna grab the character um, so I'm gonna deselect it I'm going to create a gradient on top of this now. This is a regular gradient, a regular gradient map. I'm going to assign it. Remember, clip map. I'm going to choose. So 
So we can do some, uh, some outrageous colors here. Uh, so just to share with you, what's happening with this gradient map is based on the value is the color that's being dictated. So whatever is dark in terms of say like 80% value dark, it's gonna be this dark green, right? Anything that is mid-tone, so let's go ahead and go here. Let's, let's choose this violent blue. So if we go mid-tone, you actually start to notice that that's blue. Again, it matches the value. So whatever darkness, it tints it with that color. So, uh, so within, you can go through some quick, fast, I would say base the work with. And this uh, part of the reason why I like um, doing this is because sometimes I will also play with the type of layer it is. Just to see how it reacts. But it's trying to force just a little bit of a discovery. And when I say that, trying to find unconventional color palettes that could work for your um, work for your piece. And sometimes, you know, it could be time well spent. Sometimes it could be crap, nothing's working. And, um, you know, it's part, part of the luck of the draw sometimes. But um, again, go let's change the opacity. So anyways, so I'm gonna get a gradient. So I'm gonna put a, so by the way, I put a on top of the gradient, I'm putting a mask. So I can actually just choose where sort of greenish palettes are going to be. Okay, so so yeah, but anyways, that that's that's a very unconventional but quick way of actually getting color into a piece. Um, that I've, I've done. This is kind of my, my little bit of workflow. Um, I find once again, it's trying to achieve uh, something that um, I wasn't expecting. So, I mean, because simply, let's just remove all this stuff. I mean, you could simply just do the whole, I'm um, going we'll to create a new layer. You can go to color. And then, you know, of course, you can just pick. You can just add it on here. Um, traditionally. So if you have a very concrete idea of what you want to do in terms of color palette, then I would say go ahead and, um, you know, do your color layer, glaze over the colors that you want, and, um, you know, you can, you, can, you can get to the results that you want quicker and faster, right? So that's the reason why I wanted to show you that there's different flows of trying to push yourself to discover something a little bit different, a little bit new. All right, but the other thing I want to show you is that, so this is something that I did a little bit earlier. And so I'm gonna go ahead and get back to taking off the color. So I get the lines color, done, great. So, so this is something that, that, that I did earlier using the same sort of path, once again, you know, using, using gradients on top of that. So I created essentially almost like a, the sun is setting and he's just getting hit by, by the light, right? So everything is in the dark. It's just when the sun's starting to set. So it's um, about the color palette. I mean, this could be a great direction for uh, what I would do for like a final illustration in terms of you know, overall direction. So, so there's this aspect, right? So we have the aspect of we got within less than an hour or an hour, you could have your initial thumbnail um, colored and rendered and in terms of shape and form, enough to know where the direction's going with this, right? And uh, a quick color, pal color pass. So this would essentially would be a color study. So you have your rough thumbnail, you have your rough creature design, and uh, it's, everything's going in the right direction. And then you have, once again, um, the overall color study that you can actually send over. and um, so actually I threw on like a shadow layer on top of that, like what if something's blocking him. And then again, I started actually going in and starting to render a little bit 
and just start to define the shape as water bottles. But you can see how everything's starting to kind of come into play, which is actually pretty fun and, and um, exciting. So the, uh, the last thing I want to show you is in terms of, ooh, let's get this back here. So let's get the colors and everything else away. We're going to go down to the brass taxes of grabbing this character. I'm going to copy him, create a new page. So we could also try doing some uh, quick iterations on this guy. And um, the quickest way I found to, mm -hmm, so I'm just going to duplicate that guy, is if you, I'm not sure if you ever tried it, but it can work in some some fun ways, which is grabbing him and then just um, you know doing some some mirroring. So in other words, you know, copy and paste and, and mirror uh, what the creature is. So let me give you an example. So I'm just gonna do rapid mirroring just to see what kind of shapes will actually arrive. And then you can actually start to almost like a, like a DJ, like a DJ. <laughs> I've been hanging with uh, too many Italians lately. Cause uh, I always say like, I like to make a swim. I'm like, oh, that's sweet. I like to make a swim too. Grab some of these tentacles. All right, so that's on top, that's on bottom here. So um, you can tell I'm just, uh, again, this, this is. Uh, experimental. So uh, I found that right now by mirroring it, I mean, it is quite literally a mirror of what it is. But uh, the good about it is that if their shapes are coming together that you don't expect, you can always grab that design. And once you grab the design, um, you can further extrapolate it. So right now it's 2D, right? We're looking straight at it. We can actually grab this design and try to visualize how does it look um, dimensionally? So, I mean, this guy's looking, I don't know why, kind of cool, kind of badass. Uh, so I'm just gonna go ahead. So I'm just gonna pile his body. And uh, right now, the, the key word that I try to prescribe to I try to instill is that, um, that there, there's two different ways of, of working and neither is right or wrong. Uh, the, the reason why I'm saying it's right or wrong is because, <clears throat> there it is, boom, is that I, I like to, again, that there is the, there's the way of designing by exactly what needs to be. In other words, you design an elf, the elf needs to look like an elf. Um, and there's certain parameters you got to stick with, right? And then the, there's the other aspect of um, design by discovery. And to me, it's, um, it depends on the client. There, there are times where you can do this type of iteration. When I say that, you have the time to explore. You have the time to, to try something different, try something new, and uh, they say to be creative. And there's going to be other clients where it's like, no, we need an elf. We need you know, five iterations of this elf and um, you can't go too, you know, out there with it. You can't go too hog wild. So um, there, there's different, again, there's different workflows. Uh, and again, I'm not going to say there's, there, there's so many ways to instill a way of discovery. Again, uh, I usually want to find something in the process that's fun, right? All right, 
right, so let me go ahead and scoot this guy. So I've grouped him together. Oh. Well, let's get him back to where he needs to be. All right, so deselect, move him over. I mean, uh, again, so this is where, <clears throat> so I've created a new layer and then, oops, grab just my basic brush. And um, again, if you think of more of a, a pen, as I mentioned, the, the rough sketch, you kind of go in there and get a little bit of value, but you can actually start to um, manipulate, uh, to play with the shapes a bit more. So I'm gonna grab him. So uh, I think we're getting pretty close to uh, the witching hour. So this is, uh, once again, this has been a lot of information I've been, I've been plowing over. This is, you know, kind of like a, the, the essence of, of working in, in uh, quick iterations, but um, at the same time trying to define a workflow. Hey Jason, how would this, uh, what you're doing relate to our first defined class? How does it relate? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so the, the first, the first class, the whole kickoff is, is about fundamentals. So we're, we're not only are going to be focused on, on the aspect of, of character creature design, but it's really going to address the, the fundamentals of um, your foundations, understanding form, understanding structure. Uh, I, I really believe my, my ability and skill set is, is to fundamentally see what other people do. I'm a pretty, pretty good at critical analysis and I can normally see when somebody's faltering. Uh, the worst part I find in terms of, of creating art is not knowing how to overcome an obstacle. You know, hit a, you hit a wall where you want to create something, but you don't know how to do it. You don't know why it's not working. So whether it be, um, you know, maybe your colors are off, maybe your shape is off, you know, maybe your composition's off. I mean, these are all fundamentals that, um, you know, eventually need to be addressed and, and to overcome. Because once you start to understand and overcome those obstacles, uh, image creation speeds up tremendously. And it's, it's, it's all about defining, uh, I would say, a very specific process as well, a, a way of working. And again, that, that comes with mileage. I just come, that comes with time. So, uh, so we have this dude, this dude. But yeah, at least for me, uh, again, the, the thing that I struggled with in terms of being initially self-taught was that I knew where I wanted my artwork to be. I knew what I wanted to create, what what really frustrated me a lot was just not knowing how to, you know, how can I improve? Um, that, that was to me, that was just haunting. And, um, but yeah, soon, but as soon as I, I've discovered, put this way, also art progressions the following, you're going to learn a lot really fast and you're going to see a massive progression. And then you're going to hit this wall again, where there's going to be a certain limitation that you discover and you're not sure what it is. And again, and you're gonna you're gonna spin and spin your wheels for a little bit, but I find that's that's what working with other co-creators, other creative artists in a studio setting, attending workshops, you may have that sort of breakthrough. You may have that sort of ah, that's what I've been doing wrong. Um, you know, and it, it could be technique, and it could be um, just, just simply um, spending more time designing. Uh, and when I say designing, you know, just paying your dues. Uh, it, it seemed like it, it never ends. All right, so yeah, yeah, come on, there it goes. So you know, like for example, like this well, here, it almost looks like a you know like a pair of wings or something like that. So 
So let me zoom out for a moment. All right, but um, and uh, the last thing I was going to do is I'll chew that in a little bit. Okay, so uh, with there's number one, number two. Let me uh, open this canvas a little bit wider so we can put them all side by side. Again, not uh, the most amazing, wow, mind blowing spectacle, but, um, you know, there, there's within this, there's, there's potentially some cool, useful things that, that could actually be used um, you know, from, from these designs. When I say these designs, you need know, quick iteration. And so let me get, let me move them over here. Ooh, it looks like I need more canvas. And, um, you know, right now I've been sticking with tentacles. I mean, that, that could always be, you know, change those to legs. And, um, you know, doesn't necessarily have to stick with you know, well, what's been already defined. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, it's just, so that was being, you know, kind of playful about, about it. And they, they do, feel they belong in the same family, but at the same time, they, they definitely have their own distinct feeling, if that makes sense. So um, again, you can just further ex extrapolate it. Uh, so let's see here, okay. So let's go ahead and, so uh, again, I found in this process, it keeps me curious. It keeps me engaged. It keeps me, uh, you know, moving forward. And again, it just, um, to extrapolate. And uh, the, the last thing I'll say right now in terms of design is what would really help you help you to focus in terms of where things are going is that if you know a bit of the back history, if you know the environment, so once again, if this is a big fallen creature, you know, what planet does it come from? You know, what does it eat and that sort of thing. So it's habitats, but also it's behavior um, will help, I would say, drive the shapes that you would be defining as well. So, so right now, you know, I've, I've been pretty much like blue sky, right? That's been kind of making up as I go. Like I am, the, you know, I'm in control. I'm the driver of this sort of design right now. So uh, again, the, I mean, this can be very therapeutic and very fun. So, but if you find, if you try this process, and you find you're not really going anywhere or getting anywhere, then it's a matter of what I just mentioned. It's about making sure that you have some direction of, of what to design, where it's going. You know, dare I say, create some limitations. So. So maybe he's wearing some sort of shawl or something like that. Yeah, so is there, uh, is there any, any questions uh, at all? And once again, I mean, with, there's a lot of ground we've covered. I mean, I, I talked pretty extensively about, about, my, uh, about my experience. And, um, but yeah, it's uh, the thing I was telling John and uh, the thing I was going to mention is that um, I think what helps, I think in terms of what I offer in terms of education is that I have a diverse background. So it's not just concept design. I mean, I've, I've been an illustrator for a number of years. I've been an animator for a number of years. I've been a lead modeler for a number of years. So I've worn all these different multiple hats and um, it's, it's helped me to clearly know what I need to do with my career um, because I could have comfortably stayed as an animator. I, I, was, I was one step away from actually being a, an animator at Pixar. And, um, I, and I wasn't sure if I actually wanted to be a full-time animator. I wasn't sure if I want to dedicate my life to doing just one thing. So, um, so I, I stepped away from animation and I went back into, uh, you know, concepting, drawing, uh, models, and that sort of thing. But yeah, but it's uh, but I've always uh, again fundamentally, it's it's always had a very, I had a fundamental goal of I want to work in, in the entertainment industry. I love games. I love film. And um, I, I want to contribute to it. 
they want to be part of it. So, and um, again, it's not it's not an easy road. It's a very hard path to follow. But um, again, it goes back to the root of why I said earlier. It's it's a lifestyle. It's um, something that you have to live, eat, and breathe it. Because you're gonna go you're gonna go through some some rough patches. I won't lie about that. That's part of it. It's part of the process. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Jason, I thought it was terrific. Um, your, uh, the, what you developed in a very, very short period of time, uh, I think is, gives an insight of um, kind of where our, where our first class is aimed at. Um, and then uh, thinking about the creature and character and character environment design. And um, I can't think of anybody better to learn it from. So uh, thank you so much for today. Uh, does anybody have any additional questions? I'm seeing a lot of thank yous and things like that. This was fantastic and great information, extremely helpful. All very high praise, Jason, thank you. Right on. Um, you are, uh, you're also a very gifted speaker. You, you do, you're, you're very engaging. Um, and uh, I've enjoyed listening to this very much. Yeah, I've, I've been quiet all this time, but I, it, was, it was a really great time, Jason. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Yeah, well, it's, it's been my pleasure. Thanks for saying so. Uh, yeah, while, while everyone's still in the room, one thing I would add is uh, if uh, you are interested in the program, uh, you, can, uh, you can apply today. I'm going to share a link. Um, and anyone who applies to Visual Arts Passage is uh, automatically invited to uh, book a private portfolio review with John English. And so I, re I really recommend taking advantage of it. Here's the link. So that was a, another piece, uh, it's the same, same, uh, same creature. So it's a little bit of an iteration on it where I actually started to uh, refine and bring it in. That's great. So, and also another thing that, that I really implore is that when you start working in color, make sure you have the, the value check, hue saturation. Just create a, a adjustment layer on top because if you don't control your values, color can easily sway you away from, from shape. It can flatten it out really fast. I think they've, uh, the, the people enrolled in our illustration program that's been kind of embedded in their brain um we've you know even from like a shooting reference make sure you turn them into grayscale so you can separate um color and, and value um anyway i think i think we're there the uh jace just one last thing jason's class will begin may 25th i believe that got that right to me that's correct may 25th and we're uh we're enrolling now. Uh, the program usually fills up pretty quick. So I uh, recommend uh, doing it sooner than later if you're considering it. And uh, also, uh, we are offering a payment plan for this program. So there's no interest. It uh, basically just spreads out your tuition over a four month period. Um, it's really flexible. It, it makes attending the program very easy. Yeah, just, just I know this is the beginnings of a new direction for us with uh, uh, on the concept design, but um, our our, all of our illustration classes sold out the last couple of semesters, and I'm, I'm really proud of that. So, um, Jason, thank you very, very much. Timmy, you did a great job putting this together. And um, I can't. I, I keep screen capturing these, these Jason, these are great. <laughs> oh, dude. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I kept on hearing that, the phone snap, like, what is that? Okay. <laughs> well, I thought it hit my mic mute, I'm sorry. Uh, well, everybody, uh, John, I, if, if you like, I, I'm gonna go ahead and close the room. Uh, I'm gonna everyone... ask Jason to click through the images again. Cause yeah. there's one go image ahead. I didn't get, I really wanted to get. Um, okay, uh, let's see here. Go backwards, Jason. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and let me just minimize these. Let's see all the images again. Yeah. All right. So, all right. So we got 
this guy and then uh so do you want to see the layers on that in other words and then dot the lines and go back to the base i got all that i already got that I got all that and then I the uh, i had my mic off for a while when i was doing it yeah, i think it was this one i'm sorry i was trying to find the uh the iteration that i did uh, so that one, I wanted that one. That was the one I was looking for. Love that. But it's a, uh, yeah, let me sh show you something really, really silly, man. Check this out. Uh, so I'm gonna take away all this. So right here, I have this cloud layer. It's blue, but when it goes over on top, the gradient map, as soon as it hits it, it transforms it into pink. It's crazy. Wow. Yeah, so check it out. So um so just so you can see it see it live. Where did you go? So yeah, all right, so it's a new layer. Let me get a uh, nice and it it does a smooth gradient, like it's a beautiful sunset. So once up here it's just the top pink and when it's down here. So you can really just all of a sudden hit that sunset really fast. And, and you don't have to even paint a gradient. It's just one, it's just one color underneath. It's just a blue, wow. and then and, and the gradient map takes care of all the gradations for you. So, um, the beautiful quick result. Wow, very cool. All right, man. Um, I think we're I think we're there. I think we're done. Right on. I can't thank you enough. This was really fantastic. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks thanks for uh, joining everybody. Yep. And. Uh, thank you all right. Have a nice night. I'm going to go ahead and close the room. Thanks for joining. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care.